Ah, here we are. This is what I was waiting for this slide to come up. It's from the uh, by the Roman poet Virgil from the epic, the Aeneid, and um, the Latin is uh, possent quo posse videntur, and it means this: they are able because they think they are able, or they can because they believe they can. And um, this this is the college motto. <laughs> That's why I stopped it there. The UK College of Hypnosis and Hypnotherapy. Uh, this is our college motto, and um, it's it's really significant uh, in so many ways. Uh, it, it, one of the theories of hypnosis is around this. We're able to respond in hypnosis because we believe we can respond. So ex uh, positive expectation, but it also applies to so many things in life. Um, our, our, uh, what we attempt to do <laughs> in life, the goals we set. Uh, the way we motivate ourselves, the way we persist and achieve our goals is because we believe we're able to do them. When we don't think we can do them, we can't. This is a concept called self-efficacy, um, technical word for confidence. And uh, we'll be talking more about it this evening, but I just wanted to uh, share that with you because it's so on point for our college. So good evening and welcome, everybody. My name is Mark Davis, and I'm the director and principal at the UK College of Hypnosis and Hypnotherapy. And I'm Really delighted uh, that you can join me this evening um, from around the world, South Africa. Amazing. Um, and uh, yeah, check it. Beata says she has a black screen and can hear music. Is it okay? I hope you can hear me now, everybody. Um, that you can join from around the world on this topic. Um, we've got France, Greece, South Africa, a, a lot of you from the UK, um, Cumbria, right through London and Scotland. And we've got people from Germany and I, I just Portugal. It's just extraordinary that we can, this technology allows us to do this. I mean, this would have blown our minds 20 years ago, 25 years ago, the idea that we can do this. And I, I keep, I want to keep sort of fresh and 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 and, and that, that wonder about it. And we use this a lot in our training because it does work so well. This evening, I'm I'm honored that you're taking the time out of your schedule to come and, and, and be with me and, and, and talk about this topic of um, hypnotherapy and the potential for a career in hypnotherapy. That's our topic this evening. Not if you came for landscape gardening, that's not what we're talking about. Um, we might talk about the science behind hypnosis and, and, and psychotherapy a little bit, but particularly we're going to look at the career options available. And um, what I want to do is perhaps really inspire you into the, into the positive possibilities there. Yeah. Um, uh, that, you know, for me and many people, we've had this sort of secret dream and I, I, done the same path as you before I took over the college, same path, had a secret dream of, of being some sort of therapist, psychologist, coach something where I was sort of have my own business or clinic or something. And I was helping people change. And that's what my work was. And, and I, then I got to do it. I found out I could do it. It was possible. Uh, and to make that switch um, in my thought is to do that. And, uh, and then I get the chance to help other people do that and essentially have their own business doing that, doing what they love. Um, so that's particularly what this evening is about. And I'm, I mean, gosh, that's incredible. Denmark, Milan, uh, Ronnie in the Cayman Islands and Durham, Dorset. Wonderful. And in South Africa, <laughs> that blows me away. And you're so excited. I'm excited. Let's get started. And and Charlie from Devon, welcome. Let's get started. And And what I would like you to do is to help me this evening by putting in there a little bit about why you're here, which means a little bit about what your journey is. Yeah, we're we're all on a journey. We're on a journey. We're, you know, we're all here and we're moving somewhere. Sometimes we don't know where we want to move to exactly, but that process of getting clear on that is the journey we're engaged on. Sometimes we're clearer where we, where we want to be. Sometimes it's more not clear. But where is it? I, my, I, I would say that you are here this evening for some reason because this somehow is what's going to move you forward, even if it's just curiosity at this point and you've just kind of got this, but the curiosity is a, a a resonant, important, significant curiosity, yeah? Um, and some others of you are really looking at the opportunity and want to get more information. My goal this evening is to provide that information for you to be relatively neutral in portraying uh, what's possible there um, and to inspire you. And then also I'm going to present about what our training school offers as well. But I, I, I and obviously I'm going to uh, present that quite, <laughs> I believe in it, obviously. But also I want to be um, you to come away as an informed consumer for the hypnotherapy training field, for psychotherapy training, uh, the whole area NLP coaching, that you come away with 
with with some way to more clearly make decisions that puts you in a place of knowledge and power with regard to that rather than getting easily hooked by some of the promotional hype that is out there. Okay, so that's one of my goals this evening. Um, right, so let me get my presentation started. You've got a Q&A panel here and Angela's already put something in. She says, I'm Angela from Walsamstow, just up the road from me. I'm in Hemel Hempstead. I'm interested in setting up holistic space to include hypnotherapy and massage. Fantastic, really interesting combination as well. So, um, and Majej, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, uh, says I've already conducted some therapies in English and Portuguese. I'm missing vocabulary in English. Yes, mache, mache, mash. Um, I'm here to continue my work with children in care. I want to offer them more as well as my mentoring and counseling. Sarah, fantastic because I mean, so few people understand how to use hypnosis with children, and yet children are incredibly responsive because hypnosis is fundamentally about your imagination. And they just go into their imagination so strongly, so powerfully, so creatively, yeah? And, and don't get stuck with so many other things, and so playfully. Very important concept. Um, there is going to be a replay. I, I'm just going to let everybody know this is being recorded and uh, the replay will be sent to you tomorrow about 10 a.m. Um, so uh, and and I will also let you know, and I, I'm not sure if we've got this in all the communications. It is going to probably last longer than two hours. It's been a long time since I delivered this in under two hours because I improvise and add things in and respond to questions here. So um, just be aware, it's probably going to run back for about two and a half hours. Um, settle in, get a glass of wine. We, it's going to be interesting, I can assure you. And don't worry if you have to leave early, something comes up, you'll get the replay in the morning. Yeah. Okay. And Beata says, for me, curiosity, exploring the subject. Okay. And Cassius says, psychologist, neurobiologist from Poland, interested in different therapeutic techniques. Fantastic. And Jamie Heme, Jamie Heme says, new for me, I'm a musician. Great. We've had quite a few musicians take the training, actually. It's quite interesting. Um, uh, Nathan says, studied psychology and counseling to degree level. The pathway led me to clinical psychology, but when I face with a doctor, I'm exploring other options where I, being faced with a doctor. Yeah. I mean, that is, it is incredible clinical psychology. And yet, that doctorate is a is a, is tough and competitive and um you know it's amazing but because also the level of people you can help is going to be different from in terms of severity of conditions is different than the training like this but is that where you want to be working <laughs> yeah so there's people presenting with very mild conditions moderate conditions very severe complex chronic conditions and um the sort of training we're offering is not for severe complex conditions you want to become a clinical psychologist if you want to do that but you need want to think about also, if that is what you want to work with, and it's you need to be, uh, it, it's it's a it's doctorate level, yeah. Um, so, and Aisha says, uh, from London, I'm a homeopathic clinician. I'd like to learn therapy and would love to try to incorporate in my skills. Very interesting, yeah, very interesting. Well, I'll try not to. There's a lot of the view of hypnosis is that a lot of what is going on in 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 mainstream medicine and in alternative medicine is some aspects of the placebo effect or response um and uh, hypnosis is actually the 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 non-deceptive use of that in a way so the suggestion how can we weave suggestion yeah into our therapists this is really interesting this is something that, that i actually did a, a presentation to a bunch of alternative therapists about actually how they can use suggestion um when they're working because that suggestion you've been treated and now you're going to get better is the suggestion that's there in all therapies, whether that's, you know, your, your, your doctor giving you uh, an injection or your homeopath. It's, there's a, there is a suggestion element in the healing ritual, you see, implicit suggestion. Um, Olivia says, uh, I found it helpful at times in my life, uh, also can see as a healthcare, it's helping so many people interested in um, pediatrics. Great. Um, and Wendy, at work as a social educator, I want to explore other educational tools for helping people curious about hypnosis. Yeah, well, and our approach, as you see, is very educational, as you'll see. We're not so much positioning people, training people to be healers, nearly more educators, facilitators of people's experience. Uh, and Olivier, I'm a retired airline pilot. I've been using self-hypnosis to achieve some of my goals in life. I would love to help others achieve their goals and maybe also cure their fear of flying. Ah, yeah, good. Yes. And in fact, I could talk a lot more about that. I'll try and come back to that. Fear of flying is interesting as well. Alexandra has a question. She says, is suggestion sneaky therapy? Do you not ask for consent? 
Exactly, we do. That's what hypnosis is. <laughs> yeah, you, 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 and that's why we don't do this sort of conversational, you know, hypnotizing people just with your conversation. No, we're going to say, right now, we're going to do hypnosis, and in hypnosis, essentially, I want you to imagine these things, experience them. I want you to just pretend that everything and believe that everything I'm saying is true. You see, so we're asking them to suspend their critical judgment and to go along with the ideas that we're presenting. There's nothing deceptive in it. It, it is interesting from a social psychology point of view, uh, hypnotherapy is a sort of agreed situation of influence that is probably par excellence is kind of, the, you know, somebody comes along. I go to somebody, I'm having trouble going to bed at midnight because I like to faff around, can't seem to change. I say, look, here's a hundred quid, Tom, can you influence me? Uh, I'll, I'll make myself as receptive as possible. Please influence me. Yeah. So, um, and if Tom, if he's really good, will show me how to do that and even how to influence myself. Does that make sense? So, um, yeah, we have somebody who worked with us who runs a charity in Malta, actually um, taking, uh, well, and not fear of flying, actually, they take autistic children up to, um, and, and handicapped children up to fly, which is amazing. I was thinking of something, I thought there was fear of flying project, but it wasn't. So, um, okay, let's get started. I've got a presentation for you, you second set here, just, we could just do Q&A all night, and I would like that too, because I love just talking about things. Let's, um, uh, let's try this. I'm going to try something a bit different than I've done before. Let's see if that presentation is big enough. Is that presentation big enough like that? Can you read the slides like that and then I can stay in it more? Or um, does that work? We can try and see. Let me know anyway as I'm presenting here. Um, so let's have a look. What have we got on this opening screen here? Uh, we are the UK College of Hypnosis and Hypnotherapy. We've been going founded since 2003. Um, the, this is this evening. We have uh, reviews on Trustpilot. Do go and have a look at them. Top right, we've got a logo there from the British Psychological Society. And that means our training program that I'm going to talk about this evening is approved by the British Psychological Society. It is not accredited by them. You cannot join the BPS. You cannot become a, a clinical psychologist or <laughs> chartered psychologist by taking our training. If you are a clinical psychologist, chartered psychologist, counseling, counseling psychologist, then this is approved for your ongoing professional development. So this is an, this is a, 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 basically every professional in, in any profession usually has to do, do some training each year to stay up to date. And this is an approved uh, course um, with the BPS for staying up to date for registered psychologists. So I think it's a nice, for non-psychologists, it's a nice indicator of quality. We've got a little logo down there, 20 years of excellence. That was 2023, we had that up. So we've been going over 20 years. Um, so you can take the small window of you on the top right corner. I'm not sure how, where, where do you need... I might just change the way I'm sharing if it's causing some problems because I, I can't see how it's looking, you see. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to share differently. Hold on. We'll get rid of that fancy stuff and we'll go just like this. Okay. So now you can see the slides clearly because I am, I do my like my slides. Here's the agenda this evening. We're going to look at this idea of the dream job. Yeah. This secret dream to be a therapist. And that's going to enjoy in, include a double journey for most people. One is a move from employment to self-employment. There are no jobs in this area. I want to be clear on that right from the beginning. So it does mean setting yourself up as a self-employed professional. And secondly, then for most of you, you're going to be, will be considering training into a new profession from teaching or engineering or whatever into music, musician, into becoming a hypnotherapist. Uh, and I'll stay, share my story. That was my story. I'll share that and my sort of mission, passion. I want to find out and I have been finding out what brings you here and, and which of these do you find? Are you building your career already in this area and self-employed? Are you switching career and making that double journey, possibly from employment to self-employment and training to become a therapist? I know that seems like a tall order and the way we, we do it very fast as well as you'll see, but it is entirely possible to do. I did it and I want to show you how to do that. Um, we'll look at different pathways, professional work, as we discussed there, getting into clinical psychology or counseling or psychotherapy. Um, and then we'll look at this idea of enhancing CBT with hypnosis. That's our particular presentation. In the midst of this, I'm going to give you an, a broad um, outline of the UK hypnotherapy training market, show you where we sit in that. 
Um, and then we'll look at this particular model, enhancing CBT with hypnosis, the, the we we teach. Then we'll have a video interview with somebody who, who walked the same path um, and now a self-employed hypnotherapist up in Edinburgh, Kate Meyer. Um, we'll go into some of the key questions. Is hypnosis really valid? I mean, am I going to be on solid ground being a hypnotherapist in terms of the science? What does the research say? Is it legal? Is it credible? Is it viable? Can you really earn a living as a hypnotherapist? How much? Let's look at all of that. Those are important questions. Uh, and, and, and just be very realistic about it as well. Got a second video interview with somebody called Harriet Curry, who uh, Harriet trained with us and did our online program, which is a sort of uh, where she just watches all the lectures, but then she has intense one-to-one -one tutoring and, and practice sessions. Um, and then we'll look at applications of hypnosis and how you can specialize. Yeah, that um, you can really, and we really kind of encourage people to think about getting into a particular area as something that really means something for them. You know, a certain population and a certain issue they really are passionate about helping with. Look at what's special in this hypno CBT model and upcoming diplomas and offer. And I'm probably going to, open with a little bit of news about a couple of things here. So let's get some news out of the way. We've just launched this certificate in integrative CBT. You get this or you can you can get the, you have to do a little assessment, but uh, the content for all of this and the learning journey is, in, is included in the diploma. Um, and this was a way of us recognizing and, and verifying for you that the course is very much fundamentally a training in cognitive behavioral therapy and then how to add hypnosis to that. And 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 a, a different type of cognitive behavioral therapy than than is a, it, we're going to integrative. I can't explain all the reasons why that is. We've got a uh, a page and a, a and a presentation on that if you want to look at that. Um, and that's signed by a a, a leading uh, BABCP accredited, um, he's UKCP accredited um, uh, therapist and supervisor Daniel Maria, who's on our uh, advisory board here. Um, so when you take our diploma. Yeah, this recognizes the substantial CBT theory principles and methods in our diploma. Plus, we've added six uh, free modules. Actually, it's a whole free module with six, seven videos in it, about seven hours of video, and a free one-day workshop on assessment and conceptualization in CBT. And I said the whole thing signed off by Daniel Maria. Mira? You've got a typo there. Um, and there were some Q&A sessions we ran on this presentation. And if you want to get those, have a look at them. Why, why this? Why? Because... One of the ideas I'm going to present this evening is that hypnotherapy isn't really a therapy in its own right. And uh, and a lot of hypnotherapists are approaching problems with uh, just a set of tools and, and no theory on how to use them. They just have a go. Let's try that. You know what? Let's get the let's get the drill. You know, let's try the spanner. Um, therapy is more, you know, we, we actually have to have a model, a framework for uh, gathering the information and conceptualizing what's going on with the client. And from there, we design our interventions. So um, that's one of the ideas I'm going to unpack. If that just where you went, what was all that? Don't worry, I'll come back and, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But you do need, it's not just a set of techniques. Um, so, and this is the other news is special offer. You're in the webinar, you've taken time to be here. So I've got a special offer for you and it's going to be um, available, I believe until Monday. Uh, so if you are on the cusp of choosing uh, and you get inspired, grab this. You'll get this all by email tomorrow, but basically you can save up to £300 um, on some of the things going on. We also have um, uh, can do the first seven days at an amazing price of £5.99. And we also have um, uh, for the April stage one, you can if you just want to do a taster, you can do the first four days for 299. It's the first time we've done that. Um, come and do the first four days of our training program. You'll learn, I mean, so much. Um, so those are the offers. Let's get on with the presentation. You're going to get all of those in email tomorrow, so don't worry. Here's our quote for the webinar. The most beautiful fate, the most wonderful good fortune that can happen to any human being is to be paid for doing that which he or she passionately loves to do. That's my question to you, really, is are you getting paid for doing what you love to do? What are you doing professionally? And 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 and, and is that really what you want to be doing? So, you know, it's it's something to really think about. Obviously, we see people who are, you know, singers and songwriters and artists and landscape gardeners and dog trainers, and they they're doing what they love. They've created a business around that. That's what we're looking at this evening. Yeah the possibility of doing that around helping people. Um, 
But I want to challenge uh, Maslow here a little bit with this because he makes it sound like it happens, just happens, just falls into your lap. Um, might, but usually we've got to make a conscious choice. We've got to we've got to set out and, and probably do something which is a little bit more difficult. Follow the path less travelled, yeah. And our default mode is to is to play it safe. So let's see what um, the great uh, philosopher Jimmy Carey uh, says about playing it safe. My father could have been a great comedian, but he didn't believe that that was possible for him. And so he made a conservative choice. Instead, he got a safe job as an accountant. And when I was 12 years old, he was let go from that safe job. And our family had to do whatever we could to survive. I learned many great lessons from my father, not the least of which was that you can fail at what you don't want. So you might as well take a chance on doing what you love. You can fail at what you don't want. So you might as well take a chance at doing what you love. What a great line that is. So are we doing what we want? Are we doing, are, are we, are we living our, 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 our purpose? What is our purpose in life? It's, it's interesting. Let's come. I'm going to ask another question about that a little bit later, because I think it's important we get into that. Let me tell my story on this. So I went, uh, studied psychology and philosophy at Sheffield University in the 1980s. Then I got into the world of yoga, big time, not the postural stuff so much as the meditation. Uh, and Indian philosophy. And then I studied hypnosis and CBT. And I'm bringing these three areas together, uh, Eastern spiritual practice and philosophy, hypnosis. And I put slash magic because lots of magicians are hypnotists. And uh, the whole sort of healing magic across all traditions is studied quite extensively by hypnosis researchers. Um, so magic healing rituals fall into sort of some of the domains of for hypnosis research. It's interesting. And then Western science-based psychotherapy, mostly CBT. Um, so what, what is your story? Yeah, I was doing psychology and philosophy, dual honors degree at Sheffield in the 1980s. Um, the philosophy was a lot drier than I thought, British analytical philosophy, and the psychology was a lot drier and much more science-focused than, than humanistic-focused. Um, but I did have a dream of being sort of either a clinical psychologist or I think I read a book uh, called If You Meet the Buddha on the Road, Kill Him by Sheldon Copper, psychotherapist. All these psychotherapy cases, and I just love that. I love that idea about recognizing the patterns that were going on with people and then working with that and changing that and freeing them. Um, but during that time, I, I went through, I, I had some sort of uh, crisis awakening whereby I just started to think more and more and more. I, I got in touch with a particular yoga path, and I do think that might have triggered something. And um, all this energy went into my mind, and I just began to think all the time. Uh, I could understand my philosophy lecture suddenly, and I was just having insight after insight after insight. But, you know, what happens when you live in your thoughts? You, know, you don't live in reality. You're just living in thoughts. And I began to see that I was living in thoughts and, and that I couldn't actually touch or engage with the real world, with people. It was just thoughts, thoughts, thoughts. The more I thought about that, the more I was stuck in thoughts. And I'd have moments of where I would break through and suddenly I would feel like alive and in touch with things, but then I would just get stuck in thoughts. And I wasn't necessarily depressed. I was just stuck with thoughts and I could see the problem of the mind, language, thought. Um, and uh, then I reconnected and, and it really made me, I couldn't go ahead with clinical psychology because I, I, I had such a tough time um, going through all of that. Um, and then I reconnected with that particular um, yoga spiritual path and everything settled down. I began to understand the process and um, I began to see that there was a process of kind of all the concepts about the world and myself getting peeled away so that I could actually live without all these layers of thoughts and judgments. And I ended up going to India. Uh, I ended up meditating every day. And then I ended up going to India. I went for three months, stayed for six months. Then I went back and I ended up staying five years in total in India, living in an ashram with a very disciplined schedule of meditation, chanting, service to the community, study of the scriptures. Yoga, uh, the, the postural part of yoga that everyone's into nowadays was just a tiny fraction uh, I mean, I was I did train in that, but it was a very kind of fringe little department for people who are into their body stuff. Um, most of the thing was meditating and chanting and service. And this is a dhyana yoga, uh, bhakti yoga, chanting the feeling, uh, commitment, love, 
and service, 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 never serving yourself, your ego, always offering, always offering your actions in service, never keeping the fruits of your actions. This is called karma yoga and study of the scriptures, jnana yoga, development of knowledge. Um, so I spent five years there, very disciplined schedule, then in a further 10 years in the United States in an ashram doing the same thing pretty much, a, a bit more involved in sort of on the organization, on the teaching side. I've been meditating now for 35 years. Many of the leading uh, sort of meditation and philosophy teachers on the yoga circuit actually came through. I know them. We're, we're still in touch. And um, I still love this. It, it's a very, you know, I, I read very deeply, particularly in terms of the, reading the scriptures. Um, I arrived in London in 2005. I, had, I left that whole incredible sort of bubble world, hippie world, if you will, to look after aging parents with my wife and my six-year-old daughter. I got a job as a, a marketing director for a yoga company in London. for um, That lasted about 18 months until that fell away. And then I was, what was I going to do? I had a family to support. My wife's baking business wasn't making any money when we eventually ran the numbers. And um, what was I going to do? I, I mean, I had some knowledge and skill in marketing, but I had no profession to my name, really. And I always had this dream. And I talked to several different people, and, and including some sort of psychics, and they all said, you're supposed to be helping people. The marketing's a side thing. You're supposed to be helping people, healing people, teaching people. So I was like, well, what's going to be my vehicle for that? I couldn't see how to get there. I couldn't do clinical psychology. But I couldn't go back to that. I mean, it's a huge path, as somebody said. And, and a four-year training to be a psychotherapist, and I didn't like a lot of the models and counseling oh how do you feel about that and how do you feel that didn't attract me either and that was three years um at that point in time you couldn't really be a meditation teacher now i think one can and with all the social media and stuff but then i couldn't see a path to it um and somebody said well why don't you train to be a hypnotherapist you can train pretty quickly and then you can you can be helping people change their habits and that's it you'll be working with them you know help them stop smoking and stop nail biting and things like that and i was like well, I'd never thought about that. I honestly had never thought about hypnosis before. I mean, it barely crossed my radar. When I studied psychology, it really wasn't covered at all. I thought it was a really fringe thing over here. I didn't think it was really solid. I thought if, if we put hypnosis in the center of, of scientific psychology and study, we'd see it was just a, just a sort of a fringe sort of bit of woo-woo stuff, you know. Um, so, uh, and, and I looked around, thought, well, let me have a look. And, and that was broadly true. Most of the training programs, you know, remember I've been trained in psychology and philosophy. I've spent 15 years studying the scriptures, insights into the mind, consciousness, awareness, thought, emotion. Yeah. And, uh, and I just, none of it cut the mustard with me. What was out there. I thought a lot of it was very poorly put together. And then I found this place called the UK College of Hypnosis and Hypnotherapy. Um, and it was run at the time by, it's been set up by somebody called Donald Robertson. Um, and it said evidence-based approach and, and science-based approach and also philosophical approach. Uh, it has a philosophical basis in Greek philosophy. And I was like, well, that is different. So I called him up and I can't do his Scottish accent. Can I, James Braid, Donald? Yeah, Mark, come take the course. And I'll, uh, anyway, he basically said, come along. He said, if you don't like it after the first day, I'll give you your money back. He's a Scotsman, very strong Scottish accent. Absolutely loved it. It was fantastic. What he put together, and this is much of what we still keep now, um, was an incredible uh, distillation and curation of all the key research into hypnosis, which is substantial. What does that tell us? Then all the key research into what are the most effective therapies for stress, the different types of anxieties, habit change, smoking cessation, insomnia, depression, you know, which takes us particularly into the whole realm of cognitive behavioral therapies and then how to put those two things together. It was brilliant. Donald's written several books there, um, including The Practice of Cognitive Behavioral Hypnotherapy, which we'll look at a little bit later. It's on my bookshelf somewhere. Here we go. By Donald Robertson. Um, which is one of our course textbooks. It's a weighty piece and it's fully referenced, filled with academic references at the back for those of you for whom that's important. I'm trying to look for some of his other books up here. Um, the other one, if you want to read a really good one, that one called Build Your Resilience is fantastic by Donald. But this is the one I wanted to mention as well. He's written the only book about the philosophy behind cognitive behavioral therapy. So Donald has a master's in uh, philosophy and also in psychoanalysis, um, interestingly. And then he completely turned against psychoanalysis. Um, 
this is the only book ever been written really about the philosophy behind cognitive behavioral therapy and it's, it is about this greek philosophy and and it really um this it is summed up in this phrase from the greek sage epictetus it isn't events themselves that distress men but the way they think about them yeah it isn't the event itself that distresses us it's the way we think about it and we can always change the way we think about things our judgments about things our thoughts about things our, our final freedom, our only freedom. Everything else can be taken away from us, yeah? Our, our job, our health, our wealth, uh, our beauty, our, our family, our friends, everything. We could be imprisoned and they could do horrible things to us. But the one thing they can't do is take away our ability to change the way we think about things, the, the, our judgments we form. That is our freedom, yeah? So, and the basis of, of, of cognitive therapy is this, that we help clients change the way they think about things, yeah? To something that's more helpful. Um, so I'll come back to my story here. I took the training, it blew me away uh, completely. A whole new world of evidence-based treatments for anxiety, phobia, stress, depression, habit change. It also aligned with so much of my experience and study in India and my, my, my all my meditation. I qualified, built my practice in London, had a practice in central and north London. I specialized in working with um, different types of anxieties, social anxiety, panic uh, attacks, particularly uh, phobias, um, but also insomnia, irritable bowel syndrome, smoking cessation. Those are kind of my, my, my sort of things I worked on particularly. I had the challenge of integrating. You see, when I trained with Donald, he was very, he's a very much a skeptic and always asking, well, where's the evidence for that? Where's the evidence for that? understanding, you know, uh, treatment design, randomized control trials, all of this. I and mean, we've got trained in all of this. And um, that really sort of rigorous scientific skepticism, healthy sort of skepticism, if you will. How do I integrate that with all this sort of spirituality in India? That's interesting. That was a challenge to begin with, I have to say. I started teaching for the college, helping Donald out in 2009. In 2013, he said, emigrate to Canada. Would you like to take over, Mark? So I said, Absolutely. What a dream. So I got to take over the college, uh, including the whole structure of the diploma training program as it had developed. And um, since then, uh, Fabienne, she's my wife and I, we're both the directors. We've It's been a big challenge um, to do that and to build a team. Donald was a solo player and we've done that and we've developed it, simplified it, expanded it, made it more accessible, deep, wide, everything, and integrated now this skeptical science-based approach with Eastern philosophy and practice. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, so do, 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 integrations from the East. So uh, how does that all come together, Mark? Um, I'm passionate about personal empowerment in the present moment, about sharing knowledge with people that empowers them, helps them become more aware and have choices. Yeah. And um, so much of psychotherapy um, is gets focused on the past you know, childhood origins and all of this. Uh, the change in our neurology, yeah, happens with the patterns we have now. And the change is now, yeah? And the origins of the patterns we have are, are, are not important to our neurology. I, it doesn't track them necessarily, yeah? We need to change the way we respond to things and be able to have awareness and choice so we're not controlled by our past. And this is my little phrase here, agency is more important than origins. Rather than spending time going back to the origins of our patterns that we have, our, our unhelpful patterns, we need to learn how to change them. The origins aren't important. Um, this is summed up in a wonderful um, sentence by um, the great uh, behavior therapist, Andrew Salter, who says, uh, the dog could read a biography of Pavlov, but it would still salivate when we rang the bell. Yeah, this is Pavlov's dog, you know, when the bell rings, it salivates because it's been, those things have been conditioned. It doesn't matter how much knowledge and insight it's got, it's still going to have the same reflexes. How do we change our conditioned reflexes? This is interesting. This is very much into the heart of our program, what we do. Um, and I want to say it's all about the present moment. There, the, in some ways, there only is the present moment, even if you're thinking about the past, you're, you're doing that now in the present moment. And if you're worrying about the future, dreaming about the future, excited about the future, fearful of the future, that is all happening in the present moment. Now, you cannot be anywhere else than in the present moment. And bringing people into the power of the present moment 
and the re and, and the re understanding that it doesn't matter what's happened the the most powerful thing is you making a better choice now i love this quote from the 12th century scripture the yoga vashishta there is no power greater than right action in the present moment on the course we teach several different types of meditation not just mindfulness um then that's drawing on my 35 years of experience there um, by way of um, we don't teach all of these but to give you a sense of the depth of the tradition there there's a ninth century scripture called the vijnana paravatantra uh, and it has 112 different meditation techniques or what are called taranas or centering techniques that that center the awareness yeah um so there's a lot to draw on and we bring that into the course. And also there's interesting similarities between hypnosis and meditation. Several people have pointed out to that, including one of the first people, the person who even coined the word hypnosis, James Braid, he pointed out the connections between hypnosis and meditation. Um, and, and we continue to do that because hypnosis is essentially, and this isn't related to mindfulness meditation, more one-pointed meditation. One-pointed meditation, like on a mantra or a candle or something like that, is very similar to hypnosis, which is really focused attention imagining. Yeah, And I'm going to present this idea that hypnosis is not an altered state of consciousness or a trance state. But these are very unhelpful notions, sort of surplus meanings that we add on that do not help at all, in fact, confuse and sometimes scare clients. Yeah, um, But hypnosis essentially uh, is it's about focused attention imagination. Yeah, well, And we, we'll, we'll come to that a little bit. So what we teach, and I'm going to come back and then we're going to look at some other things in a minute, but just to follow on this thought here is cognitive behavioral hypnotherapy. I'll show you that's one of the main types of hypnotherapy that's out there. We are our own particular version with our little trademark there, hypno-CBT, the integration of hypnosis, CBT and mindfulness, or enhancing CBT with hypnosis. And, uh, and I've called this a psychoeducational skills training and neurophysiological reconditioning approach. That's a bit complicated. Let's take each of those apart. Psychoeducation, that fundamentally, we want clients to understand more about their own anxiety responses, their depression patterns, so they can recognize them, they can have compassion towards themselves, and they can start to become their own therapist. That's the model. In, in, in cognitive behavioral therapy, the model is the client becomes their own therapist and gets rid of us as quickly as possible. Skills training, the client could probably do with learning a few skills to be able to notice, catch and interrupt their thinking, to relax, to be able to do self-hypnosis, maybe some to be more assertive, maybe to do some social skills training, maybe how to learn to use their imagination to do to solve problems. Yeah. Um, so we conduct skills training. Uh, and then neurophysiological reconditioning. That sounds fancy. Neurophysiology is simply psychology and physiology together. Those departments, yeah. The mind and the body department, so to speak, should never have been two separate departments. That was a disaster, a Cartesian error, you know. And, and studying neuroscience, studying the brain outside of the body makes no sense whatsoever. It's one system, yeah. It's one system, neurophysiology. So we're talking about the whole system, yeah, including the body here. And reconditioning means essentially kind of like retraining Pavlov's dog, yeah. We're going to present the stimulus but change the response, yeah, using understanding conditioning principles. Uh, and hypnosis is amazing for creating a, a, a place where clients can be presented with the st stimulus. That might be the, the idea of the spider or whatever it is, the stimulus, the, the criticism, the self-criticism, whatever is the stimulus, and change the response. And we repeat that a lot of times to get the, to get a new conditioned reflex for that stimulus. Does that make sense? Am I making it very complicated? Um so hypnosis is, is an incredible way of doing that. Uh, the approach we teach is very holistic. We're looking at everything, as you see, you know, neurophysiology and integrative. We want to integrate thoughts, feelings, and behaviors so that people are functioning as a whole and their system isn't split inside. Um, and yes, working at the level of mind, body, and soul. And what I mean by that is our deepest, our heart in terms of our deepest values and principles. Um, what's most important to us. And um, sometimes people use the word multimodal. And on top of all of that, having some sort of philosophical life purpose, existential focus. Why are we here? Why live? What's the purpose? Finding purpose in life. And I love this quote from the great 
uh, logo therapist, great psychotherapist, Viktor Frankl. The meaning of life is to give life meaning. He's saying there isn't some hidden meaning that you have to discover, uh, follow society's rules, follow your own, the rules that you got from your parents, uh, mark yourself against some scorecard of life that's out there. Um, uh, be a good mother, father, son, daughter, according to whatever that means. No, no, no. There is no inherent meaning in life. The universe is absurd. It's meaningless. You have to create that meaning on this absurd canvas of of life yeah this is the kind of the existential position and that's what he's saying is the meaning of life is to give life meaning and you become the author of your own story no one else you alone make a stand and say what is right and what is good for you and and in doing so probably prescribe that to others as well but you have to make that choice and move away from all the values that have been inculcated in us that aren't really true to our deepest heart and value. So it's it's really, and we bring that in. And um, well, I'll give you a sense of how we bring that in. <laughs> and this relates back to the whole um, the Jim Carrey thing, yeah, and, uh, and, and doing what you love. So one of the exercises that I learned when I studied with Donald Robertson, we had a philosophical hypnotherapy module, a module on, on, on philosophical hypnotherapy. And there were different questions in there, <clears throat> an exercise that we do to get people in touch with this deepest purpose, these, these bigger life questions, yeah? And one of them was called the Ring of Zeus. Donald loved the Greek classics and Roman classics, and the Ring of Zeus is a, is a mythology, um, uh, Greek mythology, Zeus. He's the head of the gods. And if, if you have the Ring of Zeus, I pretend this is the Ring of Zeus. If you have the Ring of Zeus, then... Success is guaranteed. You cannot fail. It's impossible for you to fail. Whatever you choose to do, whatever you choose to do, you will succeed. So it's a very interesting question then to give people that ring and say, so if you have the ring of Zeus, and I want to ask you that, if you have the ring of Zeus in your hand now and whatever you did, you could, you would, you would succeed. What would you do? It's a really interesting question. So it eliminates any doubt, any fear of failure. Just makes you get in touch with. So what is it? What would you do? You know, it, it's interesting to ask this question to different people. I, I gave this actually to somebody recently whose who's, 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 uh, wife was suffering kind of pretty down, really, because of different things that had gone on and, and a lot of trouble they'd had with their, their kid at school and 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 he just he just came down and kind of a breakfast said so look if you, you just did it as a little thing so the ring of Zeus you have the ring of Zeus what were you doing she immediately said I trained as a speech and language therapist and he was like when I can't you know it just came out from deep inside anyway within forty eight or seventy two hours he signed her up she signed up she's training isn't that great getting to clarity getting to clarity you know. And yeah, it's good to, and you might want to believe in reincarnation, but it's quite good to pretend this is the only chance you're going to get. <clears throat> so what do you want to do? So let's, how can this be useful therapy for dealing with trauma or PTSD? Yes, uh, definitely. But you need to be aware of your sphere of competence. Are you competent to work with that? And that this training is not going to cover PTSD. And we have quite a strong hmm, view on the whole trauma narrative that's going on right now yeah um which is that uh, very few people actually develop ptsd or trauma did you know that the statistics are, when you look at the actual data set the full data set even though um somewhere actually nearly about 90 percent of people will uh have an event happen in their life with, w which will be significantly traumatic uh to meet the criterion for being the event that could cause ptsd only about um, 15% of people who encounter that, and prevalence is much lower than that, even about 9%, develop it, go on to develop it. And wh why? why? How, how come people experience life-threatening events but don't develop it? That's the interesting question. And then what's different between the huge proportion of people who don't and then the small proportion who do? So uh, I look at all these things as disorders of non-recovery, that the there is a natural recovery process, and this, it's the same is true for bereavement and grief. 
It's a natural recovery process that 65% of people will go through within two months, pretty much. Um, then another 20% of people will take somewhere between two months to two years. And then a very small subset will get stuck um, because of because of that event, but also because of the way they're thinking about it. That makes sense. So it's very interesting to study what are the processes they've done? What have they done that's different to these group of people here? If you're interested in that, there's a very great book on that called The End of Trauma by Professor George Bonanno, who's, who's a professor of psychology who specializes in trauma and bereavement. Um, so it's very interesting to study that, you know, study what's the difference, because the problem is therapists and psychiatrists spend all, all they see is the people who are stuck. So they don't see the people that actually didn't get stuck and then go, well, what? Well, what was went on with them? What was different with them? And that can lead to very different uh, views and understandings. The author there is um, uh, George Banana. He's written two really good books. I love his books. One is called The End of Trauma. Uh, and the other is called uh, The Other Side of Sadness. You know, for people get, you know, this small, again, small number of people who get stuck. Most people, even if having bereavement of somebody really close to them, actually demonstrate resilience within, again, that that, that quite quick time frame is it, quite extraordinary. And the problem is, the problem with this is that I, I've met people who therapists have questioned their recovery because the therapists think they should be still suffering with grief or they should still be. And these people have not, they're, they're healthy. Yeah. Or because of this, all this bad stuff, something they, they must have some hidden trauma. Very toxic notion. Yeah. Very toxic notion. So what brings you here? Switching career. Um, yeah, Andrew Huben, he's quite good, but he places very he plays very loose with the science. I'm sorry. I know he's a professor, but I don't I think he's he, for me, he's not a trusted resource. Yeah. He takes one study and makes it sound like that's like the real deal. We, it's not enough. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, probably on grief, have a look, but see if you watch up George Bonanno on grief, he's the man that wrote that book, the other side of sadness. He, see, he, he did the research on the full data set. Yeah. Instead of, and, and, and looked at uh, and, and gathered all this data on, 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 on grief and then looked and went, wow, Actually, the number of people that get stuck, it's this, the amount of people that actually recover is that. What goes on? What's the difference? Can we identify? And it's not easy. There isn't one single factor. It's quite a complex series of factors. And it's very hard to predict um, who's, in fact, he starts his book on the one on trauma with three narratives, first person, true narratives of uh, the Twin Towers episode. And you have to work out which one of those three people developed PTSD and, 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 and who didn't. And, and he, said, he said there's no, no consistent result, even across lots of mental health professionals. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's a complex subject. Yeah. OK, you see, I get distracted. What brings you here? Switching career, building career, adding a second income? Just fascinated. Let's get on track here. Switching career. Always want to see if it was possible. Have that secret dream, being a therapist. People said you'd make a great therapist, you know. Um, doing work that you love, the idea that I'd love doing that. And maybe you need to test that out. Will you love doing it? How can we try that out? Helping people grow and change. In charge, this is going to be your own business. Um, is time flexible? It's your own business. You can set it really suitable, particularly <laughs> for those of you with kids. It's so suitable, yeah? Um, running your own therapy business according to your values. Nobody being able to fire you except your customers, which does mean you have to be good at marketing, become good at marketing, hire somebody that's good at marketing. The marketing issue is there. It's there for every single self-employed professional. Do not run away from it. Solve it. And the world is to a certain extent your oyster. Yeah. And we have lots of resources to help you with that. And I've done that and other people have done it. And the idea is you're earning a reasonable or good income. And I'm going to focus particularly on the idea of salary replacement here and replacing the salary you're getting currently um, or, or something similar to that. Uh, we could think about three numbers here, a sort of survive number where I say you get the water level down here, you're not using your savings. And then a sort of um, what's not thrive, thrives like when it's really going well, something in the middle, not drive. Can't work out what word goes with that that I want. But basically, where you get to your salary replacement. Yeah. So you've got survive, then you've got back to where you were, and then thrive is where you really would want to be. And income is important. Yeah. You need your, your little business needs to turn a profit. And you should not be shy of that word. If you're not, you're going to be not continue doing it. This is not, it's not a charity. You can't run it as a charity. It won't work. 
And people don't tend to get that much. They do better when there's actually a transfer of value going on. So you've got to get to grips with that idea, and we help you do that. Want you to get to really work through any um, doubts, concerns, fears, obstacles, oh, principles, values around this. Yeah, uh, every self-employed professional has to market their services, or maybe you can look at adding a second income stream, doing this sort of on on the side. Why not? What a great thing to do. Build an existing career already in this area, therapist, coach, psychiatrist, psychotherapist, and you want to build your skill set, have the depth, power, magic of hypnosis. And in doing that, helping clients, why would you want to do that? To help clients change more deeply, perhaps more quickly, to, to differentiate from others. So if you took two psychiatrists of equal experience, qualifications, da, 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 but one uses hypnosis, one doesn't, that's a big differentiating factor. Can you see that? What would be your view of the these two people, but the one, they're exactly the same, but the one uses hypnosis, the one doesn't? Interesting for you to think about that perceptual difference. This one with the hypnosis, work a bit more deeply, the magic of hypnosis, something. They've got some deeper secret knowledge of how people change. Um, possibly increasing the market you can reach, not just by that differentiation, but also because there are certain things that hypnosis is kind of nearly uniquely good for. Pain control, yeah? Um, irritable bowel syndrome, um, helping actually uh, control uh, menopausal hot flushes. Um, those are some unique things. Uh, and then, of course, smoking cessation is very popular for and, and so that's virtually no therapist attempt to do that because it's so tough. The outcomes are so poor. It's not an easy area to get into. I, I know it's something I specialized in. I probably work with about 400 smokers. So I have a special um, a workshop on that. Um, so... We're all here, intrigued, fascinated by the power of hypnosis. Why? What does hypnosis promise us? You've experienced it, some of you. You, you understand its power, the ability to create deep change, maybe to get into the, the subconscious, unconscious mind or something, more powerful change, something magical about it as well. And there should be something magical about it. And we want you to understand how to facilitate some of that magic. So somebody suddenly is going, they can't open their eyelids and all oh, their arm is floating up in the air automatically. You know, the essential feature of hypnosis is some type of involuntary response. Yeah. Um, so that, uh, the, the, you know, you say to the person, now your eyes are stuck shut and you can't you can't open your eyes. And they're going, I can't open. And involuntarily, the eyes are stuck or your arm is floating up. The arm begins to float up on its own. Yeah. You now cannot remember your address. And where I am, amnesia. You know, these are these phenomena are unique hallmarks of hypnosis. It's not mindfulness, it's not yoga nidra, it's not psychotherapy, it's not counseling, nothing else. That is hypnosis, unique to hypnosis, and it's real. Those are the phenomena uh, that are studied in hypnosis research, and you need to learn how to elicit them. Yeah, it's important. Um, not that they're necessarily useful in actually, but they're useful in developing people's confidence in hypnosis and in you and in themselves yeah there's something extraordinary about hypnosis right but it's still got all this this bad reputation is it really valid does it really work what does the research say is it could it be credible and respected or will people laugh at me is it possible to get trained would i make a good therapist <laughs> it's a good question isn't it is it really possible to have a career hypnotizing people can i afford it time and money is it worth the risk I can't answer all of those this evening, but I'm going to try and answer many possible. And if the answers to that are yes, though, how do you find a pathway? Because it's very unclear out there. And there's lots of people, lots of promotional hype. Yeah. So, um, and these questions remain. Yeah. Would I make a good therapist? And can I do it? And can I afford it? So, you know, those are the ones I can't necessarily answer this evening. Yeah. Um, we could talk a little bit what might make a good therapist. And, and can I do it? Can I manage to take the training program and do it? And then, oh, and can I afford it? You may be able to figure that out. And is it worth the risk? These are things for you to look at. Everything has some element of risk in it, yeah. Um, everything, yeah. So this is something to weigh up and see. Uh, but I, I want to inspire you in this direction and also, yeah, believe in yourself. <laughs> yeah. So my promise, the end of the webinar, we'll ask these questions. Is hypnosis valid? Yes. Does it really work? Yes. We'll look at the research. Is it credible and respected? Yes, it is actually. Is it possible to get trained? Yes. <laughs> um, and is it possible to have a career as a hypnotherapy? Yes. I've done it. And you're going to meet two other people that have done it. If I can do it, why can't you? 
I'm not special, yeah? We'll show you why perhaps cognitive behavioral hypnotherapy, hypno-CBT is the type of hypnotherapy you might want to choose. Perhaps it's not. Um, and why the UK college can give you that solid path to that new career or that new powerful skill set if you're already in this area. Who are we? I said we've been around since 2003, always focused on teaching evidence-based hypnotherapy. Surely every training school looks at the research. No, they don't. They don't. It's shocking what is taught on, on it's shocking what's written in, hip, in books on hypnotherapy and hypnosis. It's shocking what's taught on courses. There's tons of high quality research into this now. We've always focused on that. And pretty much, and that means there's two types of research. There's experimental research into what is hypnosis? Uh, why do some people respond and some people not? And there's a difference. What are the factors involved? All these sorts of things, scanning people's brains when they're in hypnosis. And then clinical research, what can we use hypnosis for? Can we use hypnosis for warts? Yes. Interesting. Uh, and then also the training course, we bring in our own personal clinical experience. Uh, with the first UK training school that emphasize evidence, I, I think I, I can't very, there's only one other training school in the UK that does, and he trained with us. And then he went on and is doing a PhD in sports hypnosis now. Um, around the world, I'm not sure. I'm aware of a few, few good schools out there in Turin. There's one in Turkey, sort of copied our program. <laughs> not talking to me anymore now he's copied the program um and there's a few places out there but a lot of stuff that's taught out there is not based on the research evidence and a lot of the training courses are sort of just what people were trained in themselves and in terms of the research and, and what's been done they're 50 60 70 years out of date we teach this approach cognitive behavioral hypnotherapy we have a trademark hypno cbt and key thing here is we offer externally verified qualifications in hypnotherapy a level four diploma and a level five higher diploma. Now, what does this mean? And we just had our annual audit on this. It means that we have, we've chosen not to just come up with our own sort of learning outcomes and mark them ourselves and print things off on the, you know, do a multi-question. All right, you've passed, here's print off your diploma. No, no, this is, these are proper qualifications. They're customized, but they're done to exactly the same level as a, 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 a proper diploma or higher diploma at those levels. Um, so, um, it comes from somewhere called NCFE. NCFE are customized qualifications. We've done them are, um, government regulated national awarding and examining body. They're the third largest, um, provider of technical qualifications, you know, uh, I can't, you know, level four in, uh, stroke care management or some level four diploma in stroke care management. They've done a lot of also health qualifications as well. Government list of national qualifications. Um, so we work with them and design these. These are customized qualifications, uh, but they run to the same exacting standards as national qualifications. We get audited each year. I should have put this in the presentation here because we've just had that. We just were audited and got our report through and passed with flying colors again. But it's a very difficult process. Um, and honestly, sometimes I think, why do we do it? We do it because it gives assurance to you that we're a proper educational um, uh, college, and we take uh, our adult education very seriously. Um, we, as well as all our marking being uh, um, assessed, um, we have to randomize, blind mark, and then have somebody mark the same paper. Everybody, we have to make sure the marking is consistent. We have processes to do that, blind sampling twice a year. Also, all our policies get inspected um, as a college by uh, NCFE. It's a very rigorous process. That gives you assurance, yeah? Um, the course is also approved by the British Psychological Society in, as I mentioned, in China, it's certified as a private psychotherapy training by the China, Chinese Psychological Society in the first ever process of certifying private psychotherapy, psychotherapy training. It was only before that, it's just a wild market of training in China. And then the Chinese Psychological Society approached the, the state government to say, apart from the state sort of training and counselling, we'd like to uh, have be able to approve or certify um, private psychotherapy training. So apart from what goes through the universities, so they did this and we were the first of eight programmes to get certified because I was teaching out there a lot. Then COVID came along. Um, Diplomas externally verified level four, level five. I'll talk about those levels in a moment. And it's accepted by the main hypnotherapy organisations. So all those hypnotherapy membership organizations, you take your diploma along and they accept it. Let me see if I've got a copy of a diploma here. 
because I think I have. Here we go. You get one. That's what it looks like from NCFE. Level five, high diploma in cognitive behavioral hypnotherapy. You take that along to these hypnotherapy organizations and they let you sign up for membership and you get insurance, et cetera. Um, there's no other place that is offering a level five higher diploma. Now the levels are set um, academic, then these are vocational qualifications. Yeah, they're not academic, um, but they, there's, a, there's a, a matching between academic and, and vocational. So this would be NVQ level four, MVQ level five, for those that know. Um, level four is set to first year undergraduate, so first year university. And level five is set to second year undergraduate. Level six is third year undergraduate. Level seven is master's. Level eight is doctorate, PhD level. So those are the different levels involved. Um, level five is considered to be particularly important, I think, for an entry point into counseling and psychotherapy. Yeah. Um, so that that's one of the reasons we've done that, is we're really considering this as psychotherapy here. And we have an international reputation. Uh, I, I was the keynote speaker in 2016 to main conference in China. Uh, it's 3,000 psychotherapists. You can, my, the video's up there on YouTube. 2020, we delivered a special training program. We were asked to train the psychologists at Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital. That was an amazing experience and opportunity. And we have a couple of NHS projects underway. That's just say 2024. They're going much more slowly than I'd like, but what to do? Um, but what I want to say there is with regard to Great Ormond Street and the NHS, you know, this is, this model that we use is the sort of model that um, uh, mainstream medical doctors and mental health professionals like, yeah? They like the CBT. And, and if we're going to do hypnosis, they want a hypnosis that's kind of in that whole area rather than putting people into trance, taking them off to past lives and doing all sorts of woo-woo stuff, as we call it. Um, is that a technical term, woo-woo? Yeah, we are known for having no woo in our course. Um if you somebody was saying here they were on this we're choosing this part one of these pathways here one of the main pathways to professional therapeutic work in the united kingdom you could become a clinical psychologist to do that you have to have a bachelor's in psychology an interesting degree because i have that as well and my daughter has that as well and you end up with it and you can't do anything with it actually in terms of anything in psychology with it you've got to go ahead and do at least a master's often a doctorate so that's another four to five years on top of your three-year bachelor's and it's set at level eight, vocational level eight, not academic level eight. But it's a, it's an amazing thing. I mean, I have immense respect for clinical psychologists. Um, you could be a counselling psychologist, which I think is a little bit easier, but still set at a very high level. You could train to be a psychotherapist. That's four years part time. Uh, and it's supposedly set, though most of them are not externally verified, a level seven or master's level. And four years part time total uh, part-time, but that would involve uh, about 1,800 hours over those four years. Many of those psychotherapy training programs require you to have um, a lot of personal psychotherapy, so 250 hours of personal psychotherapy. We're not doing that on our program, yeah. Because um, then people end up to... But anyway, I'm not going to criticize the model there. You could train to be a counsellor, uh, British Association of Counselling and Psychotherapy, BACP, Counseling is generally set at level five, as I said, second year undergraduate, vocational qualification, three years part time, about 900 hours. Or you could train to be a hypnotherapist. Generally, that's six to 12 months part time. We got like something you can do in, in three months full time, pretty much. And that's set at level four with us, level five. Um, why is the hypnotherapy training so fast and brief? Isn't that dangerous? Somebody's on Facebook arguing, saying, You've got to train for eight years. No, you don't need to, because lots of people coming on are already pretty mature and well-rounded individuals. Yeah, who've been through, and you can't you can't train that into people yeah, to be good good characters. Yeah, and grounded. That's who they are. Um, it's very vocationally focused, often with just enough theory. Sometimes not enough theory. Yeah, a lot of it, a lot of it's just a bunch of techniques people learn. Not enough theory, but. You need to have enough theory, but just enough theory. You don't need excessive theoretical knowledge. That gets in the way of your clinical decision-making. You, your mind's too confused. So it's focused on, where well, the training is really focused on you having the knowledge and skills and competency to work with mild to moderate issues. So the key thing is initial sphere of competence, yeah? So initially, when you train with us, if you're not already a mental health professional, you work with stress, confidence, mild to moderate anxiety, not severe anxiety, 
subclinical issues, um, not sort of uh, certainly not severe depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, post traumatic stress disorder. These these, these are going to require more experience and knowledge. Performance improvement, helping people become better in sports, traumatic arts, business, um, some uh, health related areas in terms of pain and psychosomatic disorders can really work very well with quite simple approaches using hypnosis. But always you check with the doctor first for those issues. Um, the key point is very practical and you start working with clients quickly and building real world skills and confidence, beginning to earn an income and helping people pretty quickly. And, and kind of we get you in the shallow end of the pool. By, by managing the sphere of competence. Does that make sense? And then you can swim out uh, to work with those more complex sphere issues if you want. You don't have to. There's loads of people in that mild to moderate stress, confidence, mild to moderate anxiety and, and, and stress issues that can be helped. It's huge. I don't know what you would demo. You know, how would we demo six sessions? People ask that. So you'd have to watch like six sessions of therapy. I think the best thing is, is, is come in and observe for a day. That's, I think, one of the best things. So we do offer observation days. If you are clearly seri seriously interested, then um, we offer observation days. You can come in and observe some of the training in practice. It's very hard to, dem you know, if we had to say demonstrate psychotherapy, would you do? <laughs> and a lot of the time, the clients just got their eyes closed. You don't even know what they're doing, so to speak, um, as you're watching something. So it's an interesting thing in terms of demoing. Is there any NLP built in? No, because there's no evidence for NLP sufficient for us to put it on the course, Susie. Um, I don't know the number of students who've qualified through the approach since being in charge. I was just looking at the numbers last year. I can't remember in the report. 130 or something. Do you consider... Your diploma better than regular. Yeah, we used to offer the HPD. Um, that's called the Hypnotherapy Practitioner Diploma. I'm just going through the questions here. Um, that's the qualification run by the National Council of Hypnotherapy. And again, they did that with NCFE, a customized qualification. Um, but we didn't agree with the learning outcomes because some of the learning outcomes are about things like trance, which we didn't agree was um, uh, um, supported by research. There's some NLP stuff in there, or Ericksonian stuff, which again, is not supported. So because it, it, it isn't evidence based, we we didn't want to we don't want to go ahead with that. So it was leaving that we worked in 2007. We abandoned the HPD and we developed our own diploma in comparable hypnotherapy, which is accepted by the NCH as equivalent. Um, uh, there's no issues with that whatsoever. Um, yeah. And we were the first private training school in the United Kingdom to develop our own customized qualification with an external um, regulated awarding body. So, um, yeah, and now we have we have our level five, which is way way beyond the HPD, I would say. Yeah. So we have a level four diploma that's equivalent to the HPD and then level, because that's a level four HPD, and level five that is quite beyond it. And, and we now have a certificate in integrated for CBT as well that we add into that. So um, key questions here. Is hypnosis valid? Is it valid therapeutic medium? What's the evidence for it? Is it credible? Are there credible training programs and qualifications? And how do I find them? Is it viable? Is taking a training getting qualified viable in terms of time schedule costs? Is it possible to really set up and run a successful private practice? Is there a market for this service? Can I reach that market? And what does a week look like for a professional hypnotherapist? How many clients do they see? Um, how much do they earn? Important questions. And how do I choose a training? Any other key questions there? And um, I'll answer some of the ones that are, that, that are coming in there. Let's dive in here and have a look at this. If you want to be a trained to be a hypnotherapist in the UK, let's do a quick sort of overview of what's going on out there. Prices range from about £19.99 for a, an online diploma with Udemy or something. Um, good luck with that. Up to about, I don't know if it's £8,000 or £11,000. We can't tell because there's one place that's offering... Uh, training that's advertising a lot and um but they don't put their prices up you have to book in with them so some people said it's eleven thousand pounds some people eight thousand pounds have a look most training in the united kingdom though is in the price range between eighteen hundred pounds to about three thousand eight hundred um our prices are in green there um we have uh, and the higher prices there reflect monthly payment plans that you can take as well um and then the formats range from live in person to live webcasts like this to uh recorded on your own, recorded, supported, what we might call a, a flipped classroom model, uh, whereby um, you spend most of the time on your own watching the lectures, and then you have 
high intensity uh, sort of uh, tutoring sessions or group sessions where you're not listening to lecture. It's all discussion. Yeah. So flipped classroom model. Um, that's what we have. So we have a, a recorded supported model with a flipped classroom uh, where you have 15 hours of one-to-one -one tutoring and then practice sessions. Um, so you don't have to sign up and watch any, uh, spend time uh, in the room with a lecturer. You, you We use videos for that. Um, and we have live webcasts like this. Qualifications are either internally awarded or externally awarded. We're going to really strongly recommend you choose someone that has externally awarded qualifications. Um, Timeframes and schedule. We have a fast track option. I mean, the upcoming fast track, you're going to start April 11th, and you're going to finish the training component, which is only about one third of everything you have to do on May 13th. So it's really intense. It's really intense. If you like taking things easy, that's that's not performant for you. It is, as somebody called it, uh, this this um, occupational psychologist who trained with us. She said, "Fast, furious, and totally effective." Um, the most popular model in United Kingdom is weekends. So people do ten weekends, twenty days. See, our fast track is twenty-one days, three seven-day blocks, twenty days weekends, or this kind of go at your own pace type models that we have as well. The length, the training time that's involved is typically between 120 to 150 hours. Uh, so, you know, that's the 10 weekend model or our fast track model is 135, 136 and a half hours, I think. But the total learning hours to qualify is going to be more than that. That should actually, I think, say 350, probably up to 600 with our level five. Um, that doesn't mean level five takes 600. Some people would take the long. Some people are very quick. Some people will take longer, yeah? Um, so you, the training part is only part of it. Then you've got to do more reading. You need to do uh, more practice sessions. You need to do some supervised case studies. And then you do your written assessment and pass the written assessment. Um, okay, so this is, uh, let me just see, was the question here. We Can we listen to your speech given to the UK Hypnosis on the website um, to the UK Hypnosis Convention? I'll try and get it. I haven't got it from Adam, actually, from Adam Eason, um, but I can try and get it for you. Um, uh, I might have it. I'll have to check. It's true. I should put it up there. I didn't I didn't put it up there on the website. I'll have a look. Great question, Susie. I'll try and follow up on that. Um, hypnotherapy approaches that are out there. I'm going to be controversial here. Um, uh, this is Donald Robertson. He was very controversial. And say the world of hypnosis and hypnotherapy splits down the middle between the magical and the scientific. So on the magical side, you've got pseudoscience, pop psychology, less research, lots of really famous hypnotherapists, world famous hypnotherapists, treated royalty. On the other side, you've got a very of uh, an approach that's very much informed by mainstream psychology, research based, evidence based, and our our famous people here are actually serious academic and clinical researchers, most of which you won't heard of unless you get into this area. But those are our kind of those are the people we look up to, so to speak. So on the left-hand side, you've got concepts like hypnotic trance, which there's no evidence, past life regression, hypnosis as mind control, while I've been, uh, I can control your mind now, and uh, conversational hypnosis, while I've been talking to you, I've actually been using hidden language patterns that have gone into your unconscious without you. Rubbish. Um, access the subconscious mind. I put that. Put that more in the middle. We just don't talk about that. That's not the way we talk about. There isn't a separate part of you that's the subconscious mind. We talk about habits. You have an automatic or habitual way of thinking, feeling, responding. Yeah. Um, we in 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 cognitive science, we would talk about the schemas that are operating, cognitive schemas that are then kind of filtering. And, and allowing you to see the world the way you see it through a fearful lens or through a happy lens and and literally yeah that that there's a, there's a schema that's organizing uh, and the, so the way the world appears to you is given to you these are non-conscious you're not conscious of these things um but we can change them and you can't really become conscious of them they're they're non-conscious processing of the information but you can change them how do we the therapy changes them yeah so rather than access the subconscious mind, that's how we'll talk about changing the underlying schemas. Um, hypnosis and NLP, I put that there because those things get taught together a lot. And 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 um, we don't teach any NLP because there's no evidence to support it. Yeah, uh, There's lots of claims made about it, 
but there's really no evidence to support it. Neither the methods, or if there is evidence, the methods were already there and just got pulled into NLP, or the theory. Again, very, you know, what what is it? if there is anything effective there, it isn't new. And if there is anything is anything new, it isn't effective, or rather, no one's done the research on it yet. So the NLP community are extremely creative, I agree, but nobody's funding the doing the research into it. Yeah. Um, and, and, and psychologists have pretty much moved on from an initial flurry of interest in the sort of 80s into NLP. Um, and the other thing I'm going to draw a line down here between the middle, which I, I think I should emphasize this, is that all the approaches on the left, the therapist is the healer and, 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 and the Wizard of Oz. On the approaches on the right, the client is the healer. Very big difference. Yeah. I never hear anyone in NLP talk about showing clients how the method works and that the, they, their goal is the client becomes their own NLP master practitioner. Nobody says that. The, that on the left, that's what we want. Clients become their own hypnotherapist, therapist, yeah. So the final one there on the, on, on the left that we've got there, sorry, is hypnoanalysis, which is this idea of regression to childhood experience. Why the word analysis there? Because the idea is we're going to use hypnosis to analyze the unconscious mind, where the buried memories, where all the dark stuff is that's hidden from consciousness. And the hypnosis gives special access to the unconscious. It doesn't. There aren't any hidden memories. Um, and then going back to childhood experience, root cause therapy. There's a root cause in childhood. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Extremely problematic, quite toxic, quite dangerous model, actually, I think, for people to be using. Um, but loads of people using it. Uh, who knows what damage they're doing? Um, Self-hypnosis. On the right-hand side, we've got hypnosis, self-hypnosis, something the actual subject is doing. It's not done to them. They're engaged with it and teaching the client self-hypnosis right at the start. We've got hypnosis as focused attention rather than as going to a trance. The hypnosis is just about forgetting about everything else and focusing on the words I'm saying and imagining experiencing them as if they're true. That's what hypnosis is. Hypnosis is a trainable coping skill, and I can show you how to do that better. Hypnosis and CBT. When we get rid of the trance concept and look at it as focused attention, expectation, imagination, motivation, it, that fits with CBT very nicely. If you're doing cognitive behavioral therapy and then you suddenly say, now let's go into trance, that, that's just different. That doesn't fit with the whole thing you've just talked about with a client. Hypnosis and mindfulness, we're going to put those together, as you'll see, as inhabiting a common domain, opposite ends of the same domain. One is focused attention, the other is open attention. And, and this idea that hypnosis is, is in addition to a psychotherapy, that, that there is no such thing really as a hypnotherapy here. Um, you, hypnosis, the informed point of view from these academic and clinical researchers here is that you shouldn't treat anybody with hypnosis who you couldn't treat without hypnosis. So you shouldn't treat anyone with hypnosis can treat without hypnosis. Now, I'm not sure that's entirely all the way true, but I think that's a very interesting point of view. And certainly the way we approach it here, that you, you're going to learn both to work with hypnosis and without hypnosis and understand how to enhance cognitive behavioral therapy with hypnosis. And that is cognitive behavioral hypnotherapy. Um, Somebody says here, are you, so are you saying there is no way to combine regression with, no, I'm saying there is, but I'm saying that's a fabricated experience. Um, people don't go back to their childhood experience. They're just on a journey in their imagination uh, with all the risks that that, that could pose in terms of people having so-called um, um, memories of their childhood in hypnosis that are just actually imaginations, but they feel more real than normal memories. That's the problem with hypnosis. Good, Nathan. Yeah, come back and, and watch it and, then, and do write in with any questions that you have um, uh, and I'd be happy to answer them uh, if you don't hear me answer them tonight. So um, what about training in clinical hypnotherapy, Mark? Or I've heard about advanced hypnotherapy. Those are just marketing terms. There's no such thing as clinical hypnotherapy that's different from hypnotherapy. Yeah, uh, there, there is not. I, you know, I've been in the business a long time. It's just marketing. We could, should we call ours clinical hypnotherapy? I, no, because it just, it's just, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Maybe you're going to wear a white coat when you do your hypnotherapy, if you learn training clinical hypnotherapy or advanced. It was advanced. I, I don't know the claims behind these things. They don't mean anything. There's no agreed standards in the profession for these things. 
Now let's look at this issue of regression in hypnotherapy, hypnoanalysis, root cause. Yeah. Now there was one of these this very well-known therapists out there being advertised about uh, very um, quick or rapid change or transformation. Um, there was an article in the Sunday Times about it, um, uh, which was quite critical um, and about sort of some of the damage it might have done. And there was a um, Professor Paul Salvosis made a comment there, and he's uh, he was interviewed about it. He's director of Oxford Health NHS Centre for Psychological Health and professor of clinical psychology at Oxford University. He is, for those that know NCBT, he's probably the world expert on obsessive treatments for obsessive compulsive disorder. Sometimes you'll see him pop up on Britain's Greatest Hoarders or something like that, treating people for hoarding. Um, that's where I've seen him, and, and we've had some chats on Twitter. Um what did he say about this approach? Yeah, root cause, there's, a, there's a, this single event in childhood. He says the idea is a single point, this crucial moment that everything stems from is nonsense. In terms of the current understanding of psychological problems like anxiety, depression, it has absolutely no foundation in what we understand about these problems. So this idea that you're going to go back into childhood and then going to experience this event and suddenly that's going to, that was the cause of everything and then you're going to get better and, and that is portrayed in movies. I agree a lot. You know, people go back and then they have, suddenly they remember this thing from childhood and then because of that, then they get the insight and they get better. As, as Salter says, you know, the dog could read a paragraph of Pavlov. It would still salivate. We were the about having a, and the insight that we're conjuring in hypnosis can be completely imaginary, false memories. And, and lots of people's lives have been ruined by therapists who have done regression hypnotherapy and particularly around sexual abuse occurring in families. Um, and then those have turned out to be entirely false memories, but they feel very vivid. Um, how can you go back to generational trauma? I, I don't know. I don't, you know, I, I, I the whole concept, the whole trauma, I, 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 I much prefer to focus on what people are struggling with now. Yeah. What are they struggling with now? Now, what you're struggling with now is a function of things that have happened to you in the past and the way you've also responded to that thought, et cetera, avoided, et cetera. Um, so stuff from the past lingers into the present moment and impacts the way we're handling things now. And I just want to focus on how we can help people handle things now. The origins of those patterns do not matter. Yeah, What matters is making the change generational trauma, whatever, you know, it's saying, what, what What are the things you struggle with now? How can I help you with that? And what I see is a lot of people end up with trauma narratives, stories that are actually unhelpful and keep them stuck. And what I want to do is help them develop the awareness, skills, self-belief, and a new story, a new narrative, yeah, about resilience. So the focus here is about resilience not trauma. Yeah. We acknowledge that. And some people have been impacted very much, but you know, it doesn't necessarily help that, you know, you, and we need to recognize and validate that experience. Then we want to say, well, here and now, what can we start doing to work on this, to change things? Yeah. 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 It's not, it's not, it's not a word I use at all in therapy. And I know people will find that odd, but See, why? Because if I if I have some medical people like doctors or um, nurses on the course, I'll say, what does the word trauma mean to you in A&E? And then for them, that means a, a traumatic brain injury, a traumatic injury, physical injury. That means the body's been impacted and, that, uh, and, and, and probably won't achieve full recovery or it's going to be pretty difficult to make full recovery, yeah? That's a traumatic brain injury, impact, yeah? So when we apply that kind of obvious physical wounding and use the term in terms of psychology, we, we create a narrative, a story with all sorts of suggestion within it about the depth of the damage done. Does that make sense? And then the, the research shows that given a, an event that happens, most people don't develop don't have a post-traumatic stress disorder. And a dis I don't like the way the word has been expanded as well, because then the people, you know, having trauma from this thing over here, well, you know, let's use it properly for post-traumatic stress disorder. I, I don't agree with the expansion of the term. I think it's unhelpful. 
it's it's a big it's a big topic <laughs> yeah it's a big issue but um anyway and, and i could talk a long time about it so let's not right now let's meet kate who trained with us in 2018 she's got practice up in edinburgh and let's see what she says i think you'll find this very interesting so welcome to this webinar joining me this evening is kate mayer all the way Hello. from edinburgh she's mm -hmm. broadcasting in um they don't have any green backgrounds in edinburgh <laughs> so not, no. to do. <laughs> and um i think it's going to be really helpful having kate with us because uh she trained in this approach in 2018 is that right kate yep yeah and um she I, I think it's worked out quite well hasn't it yeah i reckon yeah <laughs> yeah it's really it's going really well i love it it's brilliant okay so that that's a great chance for um uh me to ask kate kind of what's and you to ask kate questions as well because she's recently trained shifted her whole career and life around and as she says she's loving it so um let's find out what works there and the particular focus this evening so i think that will be really helpful in terms of um really seeing in a kind of nuts and bolts on the ground way the approach that's different um so Here's Kate. Here's her website, by the way, hypnosis-edinburgh.co.uk. And uh, oh, I'm, I'm in her website. So there's a little box about her website there. Um, do go and have a look. What do you specialize in, Kate? What's your, uh, I know you don't, you like, don't like to say you specialize. You cover kind of quite a wide range, but. I do. I mean, I, I would say that every client that comes, it's, it's kind of, it's anxiety and stress is the biggie. So that, that's always the underlying thing but i do all sorts like phobias fears um confidence all sorts yeah. i think you said last time you really like working kind of with shyness really with people yeah yeah internal yeah, and to bring them yeah. out yeah mm -hmm. yeah why is that why do you like working with that so much <sighs> because it, it is it is completely life-changing you know, people can live their whole lives kind of not really living and always worrying and always thinking about what other people think. And then all of a sudden, all of that sort of barriers come down, all of those filters come down and they're just, they're going for it and they're doing things that were, they, you know, they wouldn't have dreamed they could do in their wildest dreams before. And it's, it's just really nice wow. to see. It's a really lovely uh, process. Can you re really retrain for a new career in three to six months? Is it really possible? Well, I, you know, I've written that there, but what would you say, Kate? Absolutely, definitely. So let's yeah. let's let's ask about just the business side. A, how long did it take you, and then and the, and and how's the business working out? Um, so I I qualified in December 2018. I had about six months of intense kind of reading and practicing, and then got started in April 2019 um is that right yeah um so so i've been so since then i've been i now have a full practice basically but i i work two and a half days a week um i have between 16 and 21 clients each week um and it's kind of yeah it's grown kind of organically you start building word of mouth and recommendations um but absolutely, definitely, it's very, very possible. And even within, I mean, within the first few weeks that I was working, I was getting clients, you know, I thought it might take months to get there, but yeah, there, there are plenty of clients out there for you. So say like 20 hours a week and you're charging what, how much an hour? 75 pounds an hour. 75 pounds an hour. So everyone can go and do the math on that mm -hmm. and then and then how many extra hours are you working a week i mean on top of that are you having to work like 60 hour weeks to get those 20 client hours not at all oh. i would i would say maybe three to four hours a week um but i can kind of do that in you know i'll answer in, in a couple of emails and then i you know so i just sort of dip into it every now and then and so it doesn't feel i don't even know how long it takes because it doesn't feel like work i'm just kind of checking in and moving on and yeah and yeah. time wise then you um you got two kids yeah mm -hmm. so i've got a three and a five year old i'm a single mum. um yeah so that kind of works with a schedule yeah it's it's amazing uh and 
you know, for example, my my daughter was just getting a bit clingy uh, a few weeks ago, and I thought, actually, I'm going to spend some one to one time with her. I'm going to going to pick her up from nursery early, and and you know, I can just be that flexible. I can respond to to needs that week of my children, and I can I will never miss a kind of nativity play or anything. Mm. You know, it's it's fantastic to be able to respond in that way. That is great. I hadn't thought about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is something. Um, and what does it feel like? Also, you're um, so. But uh, does your does your boss get annoyed if you take the time off? <laughs> no. <laughs> Who's the boss here? Yeah, but but on that same thing, like you know, I normally I work to well three days a week two and a half to three days a week and I kind of start thinking actually I'm going to take a few Fridays off and just go for a walk with friends and you know so I can do that it's just yeah it, I am my own boss I make my own rules my own times it's lovely so, so what's that you know set aside doing the the hypnotherapy and set aside that you got the but just what's it like in terms of being your own boss and having your own business uh, it, fe it feels incredible um i mean i i can take it where i want i can do what i want with it i can drive it in whatever direction i like i i can be the person that i want to be in that business i don't have to answer to anybody i you know it it feels like the most immense freedom i mean i've spent i spent 20 years kind of sitting in front of a computer from nine to five and and the rest and you know it, it, you feel chained in a way that i've is gone and i will never go back <laughs> but so don't you think feeling. don't you think you are contributing more to the world when you're working full-time in marketing <laughs> absolutely not see the other thing is all of that internal politics rubbish <laughs> goes you know there's none of that there's no having to kind of been to annoying people at work or work around people you know any any of that sort of stuff it's just you just going for it and i have worried that i might be a bit lonely you know working in that but it, it's it's not at all there's you know there's there's kind of sorry i meet up with some of the therapists at the center that i work with and you know we so we have kind of christmas lunches and lunches every now and then and things like that and and then i have you know the the this peer support group and so there's lots of of people come to come together with fantastic now and it sounds like you have got the marketing sorted which deep respect that's really good i um, think the key thing is there that is a problem and challenge can it be solved that problem yeah uh, absolutely and there's a there's kind of a formula basically you know if you if you can work within the needs of you know google and and the seo and all of that and just get those few things just ticked and sorted then your website functions in a way that works for your clients and and and, and for your seo and it's it's brilliant you're sorry the, that's a search engine optimization um yeah and then you know in terms your marketing can take a bit of a back seat once your website is just going for it and people are finding you just by the searches and then you also know how to do the google ads and mm -hmm. other things too right mm -hmm. yeah, yeah 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 so i mean that's the you know the question is is there a market out there for your services <laughs> absolutely definitely huge is, <laughs> yeah do, do you have something of value <laughs> to offer people the biggest value ever <laughs> you know and uh, someone this week just said to me i think this is the best thing i've ever done in my life which wow. you know oh, it's just amazing you can you absolutely change people's lives and therefore it's deeply ethical work as well mm -hmm. yeah uh, mm -hmm. and, and and the other aspect of that is um so you've got your value, you've got valuable services here that can help. You've got people that need it. It's just the marketing mm -hmm. problem to solve. And, and, we, and, and that is something that can be solved. I did it, you've done it, mm -hmm. and we can show you how to do it. So Take don't it. let that be. You might need to change your personality to do that. But that's part of the process of taking the course. In other words, we've got to overcome our shyness. Um, being a shy therapist will not help you in your business. It won't help you also help your clients so we want to overcome these and, and no, that, that is a brilliant summing up 
um, of all the things that I love about this approach and this and the course it, it is it's a fun it's I mean and whatever clients come with you really have all the tools to 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 help them I mean there's not been a single person that I've had to say I you know I just don't know where to go with this it's like there is always something which can be applied and there's always something which is helpful it's it's amazing so no it's brilliant and I love I love the, the way that the whole approach is about you know giving the client the skills that they can take away and start to feel in control of their own life and so you know a few sessions in they'll come in and be like oh you know I actually did this this week and they've they've kind of applied their learning to such to another a completely different area of their life and and you know so they're taking it on themselves and it's so it's such a lovely journey to help them with Nice. Well, I mean, the relapse prevention is 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 brilliant as well. I mean, I I think there are lots of of therapies where it's kind of like we'll we'll just deal with this one issue, and it, well, there's lots of therapies where people that you know you're in for five years and it's just you know you're not really getting the client anywhere, and then there's there's therapies where you kind of just dealing with one issue and then it's gone, and and I think there's so many tools that. They can uh, they can apply to all sorts of areas that yeah help them just be stronger as a whole, and it, it, so that so that they have the resilience to not to not go into these relapses again. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, think no, sorry the mix the mix of the two clients love because most clients have heard of CBT, and most clients have heard of hypnotherapy, and they know that both are quite effective. And then they're kind of sort of go Googling and looking for a, a hypnotherapist or someone for CBT. And then they suddenly see that and they're like, oh, wow, I didn't know you could combine the two. And, you know, wow, th this is brilliant. I need to try this. And so it gives you a massive edge on on a lot of other other therapists. So, yeah, it does. And, and people. Yeah. When people see that, they love the idea of those two things coming together yeah, um, us to a close. Uh, um, any final words of wisdom, Kate? Uh, I would just say, just do it. It's the best thing you'll ever do. Yes. It, like personally and professionally, it will be life changing. It's just brilliant. Go for it. Brilliant. Okay. Okay. Was that helpful? I, uh, most people. Oh, sorry. Uh, let me make sure. That's coming. You can hear me. Yeah. Um, was that helpful? I think a lot of people find that very, very inspiring to hear um, her story then, her journey on that, and how quickly she got her business up and going. And did you figure out how much she's not earning, but how much her business, how much her business is earning each week? And that's not her net income. She's going to have some expenses. So, um, yeah. Now, let's be clear. Kate has a background in marketing. So, she was able to turn that obviously to good use here. And uh, she, you know, her website was really good um, in terms of both uh, how, how it really works for people and how it also came up very high in the Google searches and things like that. But um, those are all things that that, that are doable. And, uh, you know, maybe it's worth it. I really recommend people don't do their own website and they actually hire a professional to do their website. Um, because it's usually one of the main vehicles where it doesn't have to be. I mean, we'll meet somebody tonight who operates entirely without a website. TikTok. <laughs> Interesting. Um, but your website generally, and we are really strong on the search engine optimization. So you might have noticed us in the search results there. But um, uh, so, um, yeah, and we can, if you hire somebody, we can we can help give you resources to help you rank higher. Because we have one of the leading search engine consultants with us. Um, is it possible to tell them, no, we don't have any live training anymore, Oliver. We stopped that with COVID and we do it all um, webcast or the online where you watch the lectures and the tutoring. And which is, but you know, they're different. They're, they're different. My choice would be the webcast. It, it's great. You meet these other people. It's an intense journey. You're on our schedule, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., seven days in a row nothing like it. There's nothing like it. I mean, I remember when I did the live, it's so strong, so powerful. But the online department works for some people. It suits their study style more. It works with their schedule. And they like the 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 one-on-one the -on -one tutoring. 
it's 15 hours of one-on-one tutoring. That's a lot of tutoring, often half-hour sessions. There may be 30 half-hour sessions. You can imagine how deep those discussions go. Um, so it, it's really... Um, yeah, and, and those and those tutors are really they've all taken the qualification, they've all taken the training, have the qualification and, and and are have been trained as tutors and supervisors and ongoing training with that as well. Um so welcome so, to this. Um what did what did she do? Four steps, and this applies not just to us, this is any training. Take the you've got to choose the training, sign up, then you take the training part. Yeah. And in us case, that's all the three stages. I'll show you that. That gives you the knowledge and the experience. And then you're going to get qualified, which is going to be probably doing some more practice, doing your case studies, a written assessment, and get your qualification. Like that. Once you've got that, you've got your qualification, you're going to start your practice. You'll get your insurance, professional memberships, launch your website if you haven't already, and start your practice. And then step four is you're going to build your business, which means you're going to market your professional services. I like that phrase, market your professional. Every self-employed professional has to do that. An accountant has to do it. Solicitor has to do it. Osteopath has to do it, yeah? Hypnotherapist, psychotherapist has to do it. So those are the four steps. It's very simple, yeah? But I want to show you, you know, often people just think about the training. There's all this, these other stuff that, that, that come in as well. Um, do you need to have a degree in psychology at the training? Not necessary. Um, uh, it, it is quite a scientific approach. If you tend towards the more magical it can, it can, you know, we have some people, you know, the other side to this is, is the love of language. Yeah. So compared to, I mean, psychotherapy is, is the talking cure and, and hypnosis is that par excellence because we are, we are weaving words. Yeah. We're telling stories. We're, 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 we're we are, we're storytellers and we're painting pictures in the client's imagination. Yeah. We are artists of the imagination. I wrote a poem about that. Artists of the imagination. So, um, but the scientific approach and particularly having a degree in psychology can be helpful. For me, it's really helpful because you will recognize just how solid the training is in terms of up-to-date psychological research behind it. Um, my question for you is if Kate can do it, why can't you? And if I can do it, why can't you? Do you think we're special? Do you think you're not good enough somehow? You know, that's that's the question. And it's really worth rooting out any doubts about that and having a look at them. And this brings us to this a little a, a nugget sort of from our course for you to take away here is this concept of self-efficacy. I just sent a big email about this today. Self-efficacy from the great psychologist Albert Bandura. It's a technical word for confidence. And that slide at the beginning that I mentioned, they can because they believe they can. People who have high belief in their abilities. Rational belief, not not the sort of stuff that gets you on X Factor. And then um, Simon Cowell says, you shouldn't have had all those singing lessons. You'll never be able to sing. Not that sort of foolish self-belief, but, but belief in high assurance in your abilities. You're motivated. You set yourself challenging goals and you stay motivated. You focus on what needs to be done. You raise your effort when you meet with challenges. If you meet with failure, you get back on your feet quickly. And you any, any failures that come along, you put it down to insufficient effort or practice or knowledge all of which are acquirable or can be changed, yeah? People with low self-belief in their abilities, they avoid challenging goals which feel like personal threats. They worry, worry, worry about how to accomplish things and what could go wrong instead of focusing on, 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 on performing well. They give up easily when they meet with difficulty. It takes them a long time to get back on their feet from failure because they put failure down to something lacking in their selves, in their personality, in their essence rather than insufficient effort and practice or knowledge, all of which can be changed. You see that? Can you see that? It's a really powerful way to look at things. And, and I could see I had some low self-efficacy going on at different points in time, and it's really good to root that out. If Mark can do it, why can't I? If other people can solve the marketing problem, why can't I? If other people can train, why can't I? Yeah. So is that helpful? Yeah. Uh, so this is our pathway very quickly. We split it into three stages, seven days each, if you're doing the live webcast. Um, stage one is all about evidence-based hypnosis. Stage two is all about behavior therapy and adding hypnosis to behavior therapy. So that's a certificate in behavioral hypnotherapy. And stage three is cognitive therapy and adding hypnosis to cognitive therapy. So in stage two, we're focusing on behavior change as the key thing. 
Um, that might be relaxation, assertiveness, learning how to approach situations rather than avoid them. Um, and then our behavior, thoughts and feelings get better. In cognitive therapy, we're focusing on thoughts and beliefs uh, as the target for change. And if we change our thoughts and beliefs, then our behaviors and emotions also change. We're also always working on all three levels, yeah? Emotions, behavior, and thoughts, cognitions, beliefs. You take the training, that's the classroom training element, then you choose whether you're going to do a level four pathway assessment or a level five. Level five is harder. It's got a bit more in it. True. Then you end up with either level five higher diploma or level four diploma. And But both of those qualifications allow you to get professional membership, professional insurance, and start your professional practice. Now, we'll say, if you want to get the certificate in integrative CBT, you need the level five. If you want to go on, we're going to have a, also a, um, uh, a level six um, um, psychotherapy qualification. To do all of that, you will need to make the level five choice. But if you make the level four choice, you can still upgrade to level five. We've got pathways all the way through that for you to upgrade. So um, how much is it? I'm not going to go through all of that, but I just want you to notice that um, the online diploma is a little less expensive than the webcast. And um, uh, we have also monthly payment plans. So, for example, the online diploma is 2540 if you pay in full or £245 a month with the 12-month plan. Um, so that's the... And the other thing I want to say is the assessment fees, the level four or level five, are separate to that. I want... There's no hidden costs here, extras. If you choose the level four, it's 295 If you choose the level five, it's 495 If you want to get the additional... Certificate Integrative CBT. There is a little assessment around that as well. It's 145. So um, let's move on. So those are, yeah, those are qualifications and uh, they're recognized. I think we've we've covered that well. NCFE, I mentioned, they're an educational charity, by the way, non-profit. They've been around 175 years. Um, third biggest technical and vocational awarding organization in the UK. They run over 600 of the government national qualifications are regulated by Ofqual, and then we started working with it in 2007. No, no, not that we offer diploma. So you have to choose to do the level five higher diploma in cognitive hypnotherapy. Yeah. The certificates you get we are just attendance certificates. They're not qualification certificates. Yeah. And a certificate is a is 110 hours or more. A diploma is 370 hours or more. Does that make sense? So diplomas and certificates are different. And, and and attendance certificates are different than a, a qualification, a certificate qualification. Does that make sense? And these all have definitions from the government on them. Key point here is to look for externally verified qualifications. If you're starting a new career, ensure the training is mapped against national standards. Ensure the length and level. Length is diploma, must be 370 total learning hours minimum. Level Level four would be minimum, I think, really, or I personally think level five, but level four. Um, and ensure the training is evidence and uh, evidence based. Yeah. So that people are um they just made it up. There's actual research evidence behind what they do. Um, and that also then when people are saying, Oh, but this is a, a level five diploma, it is externally verified, yeah, by a government regulated organization because there's loads of people selling you know, six weekends, you get a diploma. That's not right. Yeah. Or they just use the word level five now. And and it's not I've been on to NCFE to, to take these people to the Advertising Standards Authority because it's not right. Avoid caution. Don't get trained with an organization that's made up its own educational standards. Don't get trained in approaches that are not supported by research. Don't rely on tales of transformation for the lead trainer who's worked with royalty or something like that. Don't or, or demonstrations. Demonstrations don't do the. You, you know, you, it's good for you to observe and see. Personally, I want you out trying it and seeing if it works for you. It's very easy for trainers to do fancy demonstrations. Um, these are our different, we had a little graphic done here, different formats live. We used to do, we're not doing it. We might go back to some of that towards the end of the year, but the webcast has proved so effective and has been so well received. Um, so that's what we do. And the other is the online with a tutor. So here you watch the lectures, then you have 15 hours of one-to-one -one tutoring. But what also supports that is we have practice sessions you can join three times a week. They're free for a whole year, two hour practice sessions with a supervisor. You get paired up and you practice one of the practicals because 50% of our course content is doing practicals 
in pairs, sometimes group, you know, group guided, but a lot of it is pair work, yeah, where you're 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 playing the therapist and the client, then you've got a client, and then you swap around, yeah, and you discuss and debrief. So um with the online, we have a lot of practice sessions you can join, or you find somebody else to practice with. Self-led is if you just want access to the content, it's not a practitioner qualification. Blended means you can do one week webcast, one week online, the other week webcast or whatever. No, Susie, I covered that. It's an ex external. It's a fee to us, but it's external because not everybody goes ahead with it. And um, we don't make it, it's expensive for us to run. We don't make any any money really on the assessments, but we, we offer them. Yeah. Can you get no, you can't get a government advanced learner loan because it's a customized qualification. It's not a national qualification. So to get an advanced learner loan, it has to be a national qualification. But I will say, if you are an exceptional candidate, i.e. you have a real passion and a level of self-belief, and we think you would do really well, then we do offer more extended payment plans, 20 months, sometimes, sometimes longer with no extra interest. Yeah. Um, but we have to be assured that you're uh, somebody who's going to make your payments. And the idea here is to is to is to, is to make something that fits your budget, so you can actually make that change and get into practice. Yeah. So when people ask me, oh, but can we do it? Can you do it at a discount? I say, well, what we do is we'll spread the payments over longer. Oh, but then I'll still owe the money. Yeah, but you'll be earning money because you'll be a. Oh, but I'm not sure I can actually. Well, then don't take the course. Don't don't take a loan out essentially with us to get trained if you don't have the self-belief that you can turn that into a new profession. And that's what I want to really help people with is that self-belief to do that. Does that make sense? And so people who have that, if you have that and you're passionate, we will usually find a way. Money shouldn't be an, object, uh, an obstacle. Does that make sense? So we had somebody, she was actually a psychologist from Iran uh, and she was a feminist psychologist, which got her in a lot of trouble. She had to leave overnight. She was a refugee. Uh, she was in Egypt for two years, but had seen our course for a long time and spent two years trying to get to London to take our training. When she got here, she couldn't afford to do it. So we created a special payment plan that, that went up every three months over a long period um, so that she could manage to get trained. So, you know, that's an exceptional candidate. <laughs> um. All diplomas get 12 months free membership of our professional hub. That, that's all the practice sessions that I mentioned, three to 150 practice sessions with a supervisor. We have monthly treatment planning sessions, special watch and discuss groups, specialist workshops, monthly Q&A with me. And we have a lot of business support. So Celia runs a monthly business startup session for kind of all the nuts and bolts of getting your business started. We got all the recordings of that as well. And then Mark Austin is a high powered um, uh, business coach and he does um, a monthly uh, business coaching group. If you end up in the hot seat there, you're going to get 20 minutes of intense high powered coaching. If you've never been in experience that, you should. It's really good. He is really good. And that's all free. That's all free included. So there's loads of free stuff goes on there. Um, course textbooks, tip, always ask a training provider, what are the course textbooks? Is the course based on a clinical textbook? Because lots of training courses aren't. They've just made the training up based on their own experience and their previous training. But these textbooks are really good. I'll show you the one by Donald there. Let me just pull the other one out, which is the one we use, particularly for the first stage one. It's called Heartland's Medical and Dental Hypnosis by Michael Heap. It's in its fourth edition. It was originally written for doctors and dentists in 1967. Good sign in its fourth edition. It means it's a very popular classic, completely rewritten by clinical psychologist and researcher Michael Heap. Um, and if you open it up, um, like let's have a look. Um, let's pick smoking cessation, weight reduction, insomnia. Let's have a look at the chapter on that. At the end of the chapter, it has references. This is references to all of the academic research that backs that up. So what these, the, these guys are, they're essentially professional academics. Uh, 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 they're clinicians and researchers, but they, they've been studying this. Research. That's what their PhDs were all about. So they will be drawn when they're writing the book. And this is, this is a distillation of all of the research. You know, really solid ground when you get a proper textbook like this. I can't tell you how good they are. Not cheap, it's 50 quid, but absolutely worth its weight in gold. Um, so those are our three textbooks there. Um, what about this online training? Online? When you do the webcast or you do the online training, you learn to do therapy online as well. Now, that's interesting because suddenly 
you know how to work and do hypnosis online. I can tell you it works extremely well. Um, and well, then you're going to say, yeah, but, but surely, you know, online therapy isn't effective as face to face therapy. The research is in on that. It's indisputable that online therapy is as effective or more effective than in person therapy. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but there's lots of reasons when you look at it why that might be the case. But um, there's so much research into that now, as you can imagine, has gone on. So, um, other, yeah, we recommend you have both. You can start just with the first one, but we really recommend you get all three. Um, and then and, and don't try and read them all at once. I mean, enjoy. The main thing, don't press yourself. We, we really want to have joyful learners who enjoy the process. If you enjoy the process of learning, you'll learn so much. If you pressure yourself, you won't be able to learn anything, as we've seen. Back to our key questions. Let's look at that research question. Is hypnosis valid? Experimental research into the nature of hypnosis began in the 1930s. Potted history of hypnosis. The word hypnosis gets coined and used in 19, about 1840 by James Braid. He wrote, does lots of research, writes lots about it. Um, really good, really good stuff, actually. Um, then it goes underground, kind of gets forgotten. Then it resurges in France in the 1880s with uh, Professor um, Hippolyte Bernheim and Nancy University and with Charcot in Paris at uh, the Salpietre. And they have a big argument about everything. But uh, hypnosis becomes the thing. 800 books are published by doctors and, and, and sort of neurologists and psychiatrists um, about hypnosis. We hit peak hypnosis. It is the thing. Freud studies it. Uh, Freud actually studied with Charcot and Bernheim, translated Bernheim's first work. Um, and, and, and by the way, the word psychotherapy is first associated with hypnosis. The first book, chapter, clinic are all due, are all around therapeutic suggestions in hypnosis. So it's the very first psychotherapy. Freud uses, studies hypnosis, uses it, then abandons it and, and develops psychoanalysis. So hypnosis is regarded as the mother of psychoanalysis. And Freud returns to hypnosis in his final papers. Um, and yeah, but nobody studies it in the lab. Professor Clark Hull, Stanford University, sets up a hypnosis research lab in the psychology department. He was a giant in the field of psychology at the time, editor of the Journal of Psychology, um, and studies hypnosis very rigorously in the science lab. That's experimental research, and that's been going on nowadays. We tend to be scanning people's brains when we're doing that, etc. cetera. Um, clinical research, what can hypnosis be used for? Bernheim has like a thousand different cases that he's covering in his book and he's mentions it, but they're all individual cases. And that's not really how we do research. We want to do group studies, randomized control trials. So there's there's lots of individual case study research, not so much of the higher quality research that we see um, uh, in psychotherapy today, because there's a long history of hypnosis, but a lot of research isn't so good. But what can we use hypnosis for? What does the research say? It's a proper research topic in psychology. There are dedicated academic journals. Here we have the American Journal, the International Journal of Clinical Experimental Hypnosis. This is the, the most famous academic journal. Um, it's been around uh, 70 years now. That was uh, volume 68. It's, it got, it's, it's uh, editorial consultants are all PhDs. Professors of psychology, essentially, pretty much, um, or at least associate professors. And yeah, this is um, this edition is on a special issue: newer generation research, uh, hypnosis in the treatment of atopic dermatitis, the clinical study, um, feasibility of behavioral intervention to reduce psychological distress in mechanically ventilated patients. That was obviously coming out probably due to COVID. Yes, that's the end of the year with COVID. Um, phenomenological experiences during active alert hypnosis. Physiological monitoring to enhance clinical hypnosis and psychotherapy. I mean, there's proper academic papers in here. Really interested. If you if you studied up to master's level, you can really kind of access that stuff. So, um, and there've been research labs in the most famous universities in the world: Harvard and Stanford and Berkeley, UCL and London had dedicated hypnosis research labs. I mean, if you're going to study hypnosis and hypnotherapy, wouldn't you want to know what this stuff said? Or you can go, oh, that's just. That's just the experts. We don't need to know that. Huh? No. Let's have a look. Where do we find the research? If you go to pubmed.gov, 
That's the that's a, a, a official website, United States government, where they basically have all the papers on biomedical sciences, about 35 million or something. Type in hypnotherapy. I did this a couple of months back. There'll be more papers now. 16,319 results. Let's go through them all one by one. No, let's not. That's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot of research papers out there on hypnotherapy or mentioning hypnotherapy, yeah? So it's a proper research topic. Now, we can't go through all of that. Um, it's interesting to dive into some of these. Some of them are easier to read than others, I can tell you. But these are academic research papers on hypnosis and hypnotherapy. What does the research say? Let's summarize some of this quickly. A lot of it clashes with what's taught on lots of training courses. Professor Eva Banyai in Hungary, a wonderful researcher, uh, demonstrated in her research that lots of different hypnotic inductions can work. Inductions that emphasize alertness and energy can be just as effective as inductions that promote physical relaxation. She had people go into hypnosis on an exercise bike. So that you need to do this sort of relaxed trance state thing. No, you don't. Um, most hypnotized subjects do not describe their experience as trance. If you don't give them the word trance, they don't describe it as trance. They describe it as focused attention on suggesting events. Kevin McConkie, Australian research in 1986, really big, published so much stuff, Professor Kevin McConkie. Um, if we describe the process as trance, it decreases how well people respond to hypnosis by about 20% compared to defining hypnosis as willingness to cooperate. That's a, a published from Professor Stephen J. Lynn and, and, and his colleagues there in 2001. Again, Lynn has published so much research. Um, now, a bunch of stuff on memories. A lot of this, again, from Stephen J. Lynn. Hypnosis does not increase the accuracy of memory. They tested it. It doesn't make memory more accurate or foster a literal re-experiencing of childhood events. So the idea that you can go back and open up childhood events like some sort of, sort of perfect file that you double-click and replay like a videotape Memory is not like a videotape. Yeah. Memory is not like a video. Memories are not stored like that. That's not how memory works. It's a much more constructed thing. And each time you do it, the memories change slightly. And each time, and that changes the next memories, it's memories are very changeable thing. And that's reflected in the final point here from Stephen J. Lynn and Peter Nash. Hypnosis is not a reliable means of recovering repressed memories that might increase the danger of creating false memories. So Freud's idea was that memories were repressed in the unconscious and causing disturbances, and that all of the disturbances you have, you know, feeling nervous in front of people, are just symptoms of a disturbance in the unconscious. And he thought he could use hypnosis to access and analyze the unconscious to get to the buried me memories and then bring them into consciousness. Um, he abandoned that, stopped using it. Other people have taken that up now and still do that. The idea we can go back to, particularly the idea you're going to go back to a traumatic event in childhood where no memories of that event exist in the first place. I don't know. I just think something bad happened in my childhood. Let's use hypnosis and discover it. No, do not do that. That is very dangerous, creating false memories then. So um, now this is an interesting one on the positive side, so to speak. These guys found that they could take people's responsiveness and increase it by running them through a skills training program. See, people respond differently. Those people you see in stage hypnosis shows are virtuoso, super high responders. On the other end of the spectrum, you have people who don't respond at all, really. And in the middle, so you have a distribution curve like this in terms of the population of responders. Gorosi and Spanos found you could take really low responders and you could run them through a brief training program and they became high responders. That's super cool. Um, I've got something about that. I, I don't know Robert Monroe from the Monroe Institute. Um, past life regression. I've I used to have a slide on that. I've taken it off. I, I mean, what to say? I spent five years in India, so I do know reincarnation theory, and it's got nothing to do. I mean, it's just so this is just a Western concept. What can we say? In India, in reincarnation theory, as in the subcon in the subcontinent of India, um A, you've had millions, billions of births, and very few of them are human births. Yeah. So it's extremely rare. Maybe one every 100,000 or million or 10 million lifetimes you get a human birth. Most of the time you're going to spend being insects and animals, sometimes gods and angels. If you've got good karma, bad karma. But the key thing is you have no awareness and choice. You're just, 
There's no choice. Only in a human birth do you have choice. So human birth is rare, yeah? Now, how come every time people do past life regression, they have a past life regression for people being a human? Why, can't, why are they never a, 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 an angel or a worm or a badger or a rat or what, huh? or an amoeba? How come they never have past life experiences like that? It's completely got nothing to do with the tradition. Actually, a research study by um, Spanos, actually. Spanos was one of the researchers in it. Compared past life experiences in Canada in, in hypnotherapy to past life experiences in South Korea. Everybody in Canada had a past life experience as a human being. Everybody in South Korea had a past life experience as an animal. Never an amoeba or a worm, always a sort of a bear or a fox or a, um, an eagle or something like that, yeah. So what do you make of that? What do you think about that? Can you see? You see, in hypnosis, people are extremely suggestible. They respond and their imagination goes on powerful flights of imagination, flights of fancy. And then they have very powerful experiences very easily in hypnosis. So the cultural beliefs about the past lives are mediating the experience, but the experience is pure imagination. In the Indian tradition, in the Indian subcontinent, in the reincarnation theory, you cannot penetrate the amnesiac barrier about your past lives until just before you reach enlightenment. So the Buddha only remembered his past lives like the fume just before he became enlightened. He remembered all his 800 million past lives. Do you think that's his best? Core beliefs is a different issue. Yeah, we deal with core beliefs when we come to cognitive therapy very strongly. We look at that completely differently. But the formation of core beliefs is not something that occurs due to some single event. Yeah. These things build up over time. They become reinforced over time, they become encrusted and stuck over time through hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of experiences each day, thoughts, etc. Yeah. The idea that things come from some single core is some simplistic nonsense. Life is complex, yeah? The formation of how we come to be is complex. We've all had millions of experiences, and that's led us to who we are. The question we have as therapists is, given that, how do we change? Yeah, change takes place now, not in the origins of what happened on the billiard ball table of life 30 years ago when somebody hit our ball down there. We've hit millions of balls in the 30 years in between. Does that make sense? And our core beliefs reflect a certain unhelpful negative core beliefs re reflect a certain stuckness and psychological rigidity. Yeah. We haven't updated our beliefs. <laughs> yes, we might have started those when we were five years old, but we haven't updated them. It's not origin point is not important. The important point is at the stuckness that they haven't updated especially considering they are so unhelpful. So key points from research here. Hypnosis is not about being relaxed, although that can help. Hypnosis is not about a trance state, but I would rescue the word here and turn it into a verb, being entranced with an idea, entranced with a story, as in focused, absorbed. You know, you get entranced with a movie, entranced with a story on the radio. You're going to get entranced with the new story in hypnosis of being more confident, resilient, creative, etc. Abilities of the subject being hypnotized are much more important than the abilities of the operator, the hypnotist. Memory is not more accurate under hypnosis. There's a high likelihood of false memories in hypnosis because hypnotic experiencing is much more vivid than normal remembering. Gullibility is not suggestibility. The ability to influence outside of your awareness, gullibility, is not related to your ability to focus your attention, imagine and experience things. And hypnosis is a trainable skill. That's what the research shows, isn't that? Do you think that's interesting? Doesn't that give you a different sense? It, it, I mean, don't all the same things, those exotica you see, people can't remember their name. They think they're five years old. They're, they're drinking uh, vinegar, thinking it's wine. All that stage hypnosis exotica, it's all true, but it's explained by different models in this approach. 
And of course, we don't use that. We don't use those sort of exotic phenomena much in therapy, but they can be interesting. You should be able, you should know them. You should be able to elicit them. And then clients can really go, wow, I'm really in hypnosis. And off they go. Then we can give the therapeutic suggestions. Now, I'm going to send you this report by email. I'm not going to go through it. This is an official report. Somebody said, where do we find out the research? This was an official report. It was done 20 years ago, but it's still really good. It's the only official report um, published by a psychological society anywhere in the world. And Michael Heap was one of the lead people on it. It's a 21-page report. Really good. Yeah, the BPS said, we need to put out something with the British public about hypnosis. It's not on their website anymore, but it's still a really good report. And I think it's, it, it's really useful. So have a good read of that. Um, what does it say there? Uh, just let's look very simply. They were looking at it from a, uh, a therapeutic, educational, forensic, entertainment point of view. With regard to therapeutic view of hypnosis, they said hypnosis is a valid subject for scientific study and research and a proven therapeutic medium. And enough studies have now accumulated to suggest the inclusion of hypnotic procedures may be beneficial in the management and treatment of a wide range of conditions and problems encountered the practice of medicine, psychiatry, and psychotherapy. So they, they're totally positive about hypnosis here. They, they're not positive about using regression, by the way. They came out with lots of warnings about that in this report, as you will see if you read it. Um, we're not going to look at this bit about hypnotherapy for dental work. But I just found this page on the Royal College of Psychiatrists because people say, well, what is where's the research? It's very hard because there's so much of it. How do we summarize it? So it's nice to see these professional organizations making um, statements that summarize the research. And the Royal College of Psychiatrists here in the United Kingdom said research has shown the following psychological conditions can be helped by hypnotherapy, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, insomnia, eating disorders, functional disorders like headaches, irritable bowel syndrome, or backaches that have a sort of psychological component, and improving memory of people who've experienced a brain injury. That's interesting, isn't it? Um, yeah, stroke rehabilitation uh, and traumatic brain injury. Hypnosis has got really interesting function there. Plus, they say, it has also been shown to help in the following medical conditions, often by reducing anxiety, but also by reducing other symptoms. Pain, medical and surgical procedures, cancer treatment side effects, anesthetic procedures, burn wound care, dental procedures, a lot of medical stuff here, can you see? Childbirth, menopausal symptoms, initial warts and other skin conditions can be improved by hypnotherapy. This is possible through the positive effects hypnosis has on the immune system. And hypnotherapy may also be effective for people who are trying to quit smoking or lose weight. I, I Personally, I think that's a very generous statement by them. I would not make quite such a positive statement. I, hypnotherapy on its own can be problematic with the therapist is just doing hypnosis for smoking cessation or weight loss. You have to combine it with cognitive behavioral approaches, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, anyway, enough said there. Um, how effective is hypnotherapy? So they say the effectiveness of hypnotherapy depends on the individual, depends on the person coming along. Studies have shown that hypnotherapy can help to treat a range of physical and mental health conditions, mentioned above. A skilled hypnotherapist can also adapt suggestions in hypnotherapy to specific problems and measure your progress across sessions. And this is exactly the sort of thing you're going to learn to do. In many cases, hypnotherapy and other uses of suggestion can provide fast, effective treatment. Hypnotherapy and other uses of suggestion. So, you know, they... Hypnosis is essentially a suggestion therapy, yeah? Imagine suggesting that you're going to get better. Um, so very helpful summary, I think, from them. Very encouraging. Now, this is a lecture that we deliver at the start on day one of our training. It's much longer than this. I'm just going to give you the five-minute summary. But the, in the field of hypnotherapy, it's confusing. There are lots of different things. The claim is made and lots of different types. So I want you to give a sort of high level view of what, how I consider the, the field splits into four main types. One is traditional hypnosis. And this is uh, usually associated with sort of a, a, a trance induction and going into a relaxed state and then suggestions are given and sort of accepted by the subject. The idea is that sort of by going into this relaxed trance state, uh, they, they can access the unconscious or subconscious mind and we can put the suggestions in sort of like letters into a letterbox sort of thing. Um, I, this, there's no, doesn't seem to be any role for the subject in this apart from just to get very relaxed. Um, it does work very well generally, although actually people will be doing a lot more than, than we thought when it works well. 
But uh, that's the way it's taught. You know, and so you pe people will say things like, well, if you've got to work with addiction, you've got to get them into the ultra deep trance state. Um, you have to use this type of induction. Rubbish. No research around that at all. Um, so many myths around hypnosis. Hypnoanalysis. Here's the idea that uh, the problems you have now are due to problems in childhood that have been sort of repressed into the unconscious mind. Hypnosis gives special access to the hidden corners of your mind, the unconscious. And in hypnosis, we're going to find the root cause and go back there. So using hypnosis to find the root cause, the originating cause in childhood, go back, journey back in time, access that, relive that, process the emotion, update the beliefs. Hey ho, bring you back to the present moment. You're better. Very, uh, very powerful emotional journey, which in itself might be some kind of some sort of placebo as well. Um, and, and there are notable problems with that that I mentioned earlier. Ericksonian, who's knows who's heard of Milton Erickson? Anybody? Um, Milton Erickson, brilliant psychiatrist in the United States, um, who, who who essentially developed his own method of self-hypnosis just through his own intelligence, not reading any books when he was a teenager, to to treat his polio and overcome the pain of the polio and the um and his paralysis that he had. Genius, absolute genius man. Um, and then went on to become a very senior psychiatrist and then and, and created some real revolutionary differences in the way he did hypnotherapy and used hypnotherapy. Um, however, I think it's very difficult to treat, to teach. Um, lots of people teach it. And now we have the soup of the soup of the soup, and everyone loves all oh, the special Ericksonian approaches. Erickson used to say, A, you have to make up a completely new approach with each client, which is challenging for novice therapists. And B, that our aim is to bypass the conscious mind and speak to the creative unconscious, rather than the unconscious mind being a sort of seething mass of hidden, dark stuff. Freud's idea. In Erickson's model, the unconscious is sort of filled with light and creativity and, and is providing the solutions if only our damn conscious mind wasn't in the way. So his idea that with hypnosis, he could bypass the conscious mind and could speak to the creative unconscious uh, with hidden messages. He could hypnotize people without them being aware of it um, and all sorts of things like this. And one of the main points he says was that indirect suggestion was more powerful than direct suggestion. And in, in indirect suggestion, we, we're not we're not directly suggesting your eyes are getting heavy and tired. You might say, you know, I once knew somebody who liked to have their eyes become heavy and tired and and they, you know, just or just follow my voice or just do whatever you want. Very, very permissive, indirect style. Um, and in research, it is not shown that indirect is more powerful than direct. Um, but that sort of permissive style can be useful. And there's lots of interesting things to learn from Ericsson. Um, and we have a lot of people who've trained in Ericsson and hypnotherapy come and take our training because they didn't feel confident to set themselves up as therapists. Uh, NLP, I'm not going to talk more about it there, but often is bundled in there with an Ericksonian approach. Um, cognitive behavioral hypnotherapy, the full approach. Let's look at that. So there's a four main traditional hypnosis, hypnoanalysis, Ericksonian hypnotherapy, often bundled with NLP, cognitive behavioral hypnotherapy. Have a look around and see if you can t test yourself and see if you can recognize which of these models might different training courses or books might have. Cognitive behavioral hypnotherapy, our version of that is hypno-CBT. We're going to combine hypnosis with CBT because we don't use a trance model. We use a non-trance, non-special state model. Um, and, and in this model, all hypnosis is self-hypnosis, something that we're focused on. The client is actually doing something. They're not passive. They're busy imagining, talking to themselves, doing things, trying to get things to work. Yeah. Um, and there's a focus on the here and now, not origins. And there's a focus on identifying what maintains the problem. What keeps people stuck rather than when it started? What keeps them stuck? Why haven't they moved on? Emotional, behavioral, cognitive habits that maintain problems, the maintaining factors or the stuckness factors. And we focus on psychoeducation. The client learns about anxiety, their own symptoms and, 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 and their own tendencies and patterns. They become their own therapist. And there's a focus on teaching, rehearsing, coping skills that the client takes, learns in the therapy room, but tries out in real life. And, and in that, we want them out in the real world, performing experiments. We kind of use a scientific model. We want the client performing experiments and gathering data that then update their beliefs. 
So these old core beliefs get updated because they try, they have new corrective experiences, very lovely word, corrective experiences that unfreeze those old beliefs, those old stuck core beliefs. Um, it's a very collaborative model. Client and therapist are shoulder to shoulder, two experts working on the problem. Client's an expert on their life. Compared to standard CBT, we're going to use a lot more relaxation because it's really good. Hypnosis is great for it. A lot of imagery work and imagination, of course, and also expectancy and beliefs. Yeah. So placebo response, you, 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 you expect to get better because you believe you've been treated. Here we're going to, you know, hypnosis is the non-deceptive use of the placebo response. Close your eyes and imagine you are getting better with this treatment right now. Yeah. Um, CBT is currently the best evidence, psychotherapy, and we've got strong evidence now that if you add hypnosis to CBT, it makes things better. Let's take a look at the research on that quickly. Um, this 2021 research study looked around the world and looked to see how many people had done a randomized control trial where people were randomly put in two groups and one group got CBT, and the other group got hypnosis, CBT with hypnosis. They found 48 different randomized control trials have been done. They crunched all the data on that. I think it was like 3,800 participants across them. Um, and they found that 72% of people at follow-up, that means I think six-month follow-up, had better outcomes than people who just had CBT on their own. The people that had hypnosis with CBT, 72% of them did better than people who had just CBT on its own. That's our main reason and rationale for the approach. That's really strong research supporting it. Um so uh, I'm not going to go with placebo response here. I'm running behind time already. Um, so um, I, Professor Evan Kirsch has called hypnosis a non-deceptive mega placebo. And I said, you know, placebo pill, you take a pill and, and you imagine you're going to get better. We can even give people a pill and ask them to imagine that this pill will take them into hypnosis. And off they go into however they define hypnosis or they've understood hypnosis or it's defined for them. Um, so you can use it. Uh, you can induce hypnosis with by giving people a sugar pill. Um, the model we teach is a blend, as you've been picking up, of hypnosis, CBT, and mindfulness, and that's approximately the the content mix there. Forty percent hypnosis, though it's a cognitive behavioral model of hypnosis. Forty percent of cognitive behavioral therapy. Twenty percent mindfulness. Um, and we got a split here. We, we look at mindfulness as being on the same domain as hypnosis. Yeah, hypnosis is not a trance state. And mindfulness, meditation is not a trance. They're both to do with attention. Hypnosis is super focused attention. And mindfulness is like a sort of wide angle lens, open attention. And we can consider many issues that clients arrive with as being due to a sort of automatic negative self-hypnosis. People are hypnotized by their automatic negative thoughts. And they believe those thoughts that pop up and act as if they're true. And our first job might be to help dehypnotize them from those negative automatic thoughts and then show them how to rehypnotize themselves with more helpful thoughts. Um, we mentioned this already. Special focus in this approach. Let's highlight a few things that are interesting and useful here. Um, somatic aspects. So we're really into um, muscle relaxation, big time. Jacobson's work, uh, say we're kind of somewhat experts on that. Um, so we're really into body, becoming really aware of the body and particularly tension in the body and how to release tension. And that's progressive muscle relaxation. I developed a special method called a, uh, tension release breathing that, that, that does it extremely effectively. Then also really into um, uh, authenticity and self-expression, people being really open and, and really opening out and expressing how they feel. It's, I think it's why therapy works very much is people start to express how they feel and so that the emotions and behavior start to become joined up again instead of people privately having their emotions and their external behavior is like they look all calm, but inside they're... <laughs> They express how they feel. They become more authentic. Uh, and this gets ties into then assertiveness training. And I was responsible for publishing and wrote a forward to this book. If there's one book to read, which is an absolute blast, Conditioned Reflex Therapy by Andrew Salter. Um, I helped get this republished. It is a fantastic book that essentially started behavior therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy. It was published in 1949, I think, originally. Um, it's so fun to read. He's such a provocative writer. 
um, and all sorts of people from H.G. Wells to Aldous Huxley to Stephen Hayes um, uh, to Albert Ellis have commented uh, about how effective this book is. So it has an introduction from me as well. Um, we developed special methods so uh, people don't have to be self-conscious anymore, can train you out of self-consciousness very quickly. Um, that's that feeling of being observed by other people and then judging you. It's very easy to change that. And negative core beliefs. Again, when you get your eye on that properly, and they're just rubbish, they're not true at all, and they're so unhelpful. So we want to get them out and rip them up, and we show you a way to how to change that. And the, and this philosophical. I don't think most courses get into this sort of philosophical hypnotherapy, you know. If you had the ring of Zeus and you did not could not fail, could only succeed, what would you do? You ask these questions, gets people in touch with their deepest passion and values. Yeah, and all this other stuff has confused their life, you see. A um, few other quick questions. Is hypnosis legal? We'll wrap up soon. There's no legislation or laws regarding hypnotherapy. Yes, anyone can call themselves a hypnotherapist. Outside the UK, that's also generally true. Um, in the United States, the state-by-state -state restrictions. So I do have my other stipulate here. In Florida, I can't call myself a therapist or a hypnotherapist. I'm a certified hypnotist. Certified professional hypnotist um, in Florida. So if you're in America, we have a process by which you can get certified uh, professional hypnotist in America if you need to. Um, and we've got a special page which is gathered, I think, is probably the best set of resources anywhere in the world on hypnosis and the law. Have a look at that page. Um, what about credibility? In the United Kingdom, hypnosis has got a powerful positive reputation with the British public. I, if you look at Google Trends, you can see search trends over time. Uh, and here I've compared hypnotherapy to psychotherapy for the past five years. And we can see that uh, hyp hypnotherapy is generally more popular as a search term than psychotherapy. Um, what about with medical professionals? I kind of indicated a little bit earlier that in fact, they don't really have a problem with it. So in 2005, I know it's a bit old, but there was a survey done of doctors' attitudes to hypnotherapy with regard to irritable bowel syndrome and hypnotherapy. 406 GPs were asked. Um, and one of the questions was, do you think, could hypnotherapy help with the psych physical and psychological problems of IBS? Um, and their views were this. 72.9% thought it could help with the physical problems and 77.4% with the psychological problems. That's before all the research came out. Now, while Tracy says, what about the NHS? They recognize it. The NHS isn't focused on therapies. They're focused on treatments. So they do recognize gut-focused hypnotherapy for irritable bowel syndrome. That is in the guidelines for the NHS. For chronic severe um, uh, IBS, um, Hypnosis is a recommend, hypnotherapy is recommended, gut focused hypnotherapy. And, and you can see how strongly the doctors were already leaning in this direction, even before the research came out. Can you get it under the NHS? It's very hard. <laughs> it's very hard to get it. Why? Because um, the NHS doesn't just doesn't hire any hypnotherapists. It's just not been into, well integrated into services. Um, so they do recognize it. They don't recognize it for other things, they do recognize CBT. They don't recognize the research of adding. I mean, they don't. It's NICE who set National Institute of Clinical Care and Excellence, set the guidelines, and it's all per condition. Yeah. So, um, yeah, in the NHS is not a single thing. And so different trusts have different guidelines on it. But, um, yeah. But for gut-focused hypnotherapy, yes. Uh, and, and we've trained quite a few people, and, and and the NHS has trained people, paid for people to come and train with us, particularly working in pain units um, uh, and also uh, units to, to be working with children, yeah, um, and using hypnosis to help, particularly with medical procedures that children have to go through, really. And, and as I said, you know, the... Uh, well, they, they pay... The NHS paid for us to train the psychologists at Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital, but, but you see this this hospital by hospital, trust by trust, yeah. Um, but it is in the guidelines for um, irritable bowel syndrome. Is it viable? Can it and living as a hypnotherapist? I've got a presentation here. Let's look at this from Harriet, who's uh, trained with us. Um, as I mentioned earlier, she doesn't have a website, really. She has mostly social media marketing. Let's hear what she says here. 10, 15 minutes here. So let's dive in and... Um, Let's just answer, before you tell us our story, just let's answer that question. 
do you, is it possible to earn an income there you saw my question that i set up yeah yeah uh, it is it's, it's possible i i'm a full-time cognitive behavioral hypnotherapist it's my only stream of income at the moment um just doing one-on-one -on -one private work uh, so it's great <laughs> and when did you so let's let's go back when did you when did you start your training um, so I signed up in 2019 at the tail end, started in January 2020, which interesting time to yeah. start. Um, and I was working full time in finance at the time. So I did the online um, route so that I could be flexible and have my full time job and also train on the side. And that was absolutely perfect for me. And um, it took me about 10 months to complete the training um i could have done it quicker than that but i was working and that was fine um and so yeah i qualified at the end of 2020 and i ended up leaving finance in march 2021 so about, a year ago so about three months after you qualified three or four months after you qualified you actually quit your job and went full time yeah i was i had like I had a, a, a few clients up straight after I qualified, um, but I was taking it really slowly. Um, and then I decided, then I decided to rugby tackle it. And <laughs> so that's, that's the interesting question. I always say that, you know, whether to go to kind of go, well, I'm just going to build it slowly or to go, you know what, I've got to just, I've just got to jump in. Yeah. I, I decided, and I, I'm really glad I did it this way, but, whilst I was still working full time, I decided, this is when I decided to, you know, invest in my website, um, pay that annual fee, um, sign up to all the professional memberships, just do all of that admin stuff. So then when you start, you can just, you can just focus on the client work and the education and that important stuff when you got the admin stuff out of the way. So I got all my insurance and everything done when I was still working full time. And I just did that as soon as possible so that I couldn't change my mind. <laughs> <laughs> commitment, commitment. There's something I've been mm -hmm. using this quote from Goethe that boldness has genius and magic in it. You know, and once you commit, things start to happen that you would never have expected if you didn't mm. commit. Um, mm. And yeah, there's something to that, isn't there? Yeah, 100%. You know, you have to, because obviously there's fear there if you're starting a new profession. Um, and you kind of just have, you have to challenge that fear. And I did that by committing <laughs> to a lot, of, a lot of professional memberships and insurance and all of that stuff. <laughs> I, I, I love your attitude on that. I think, I don't think mm -hmm. I was, I mean, you know, when I trained, I think I was much more hesitant in terms of kind of taking that, like really going for it step. And, uh, mm -hmm. but um, that's, yeah, I so admire the, the, the way you, you, you rugby tackled it, as you said. So mm. let everyone know you. So your background is, um, I mean, you, how, yes. how do you come to choose to do that? So I did my degree in psychology and I actually always wanted to be a therapist. Thought I was going to do counseling psychology, um, counseling psychology route. Didn't long story, but, um, yeah. And then I ended up thinking, okay, I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to get a graduate role and see what, see what I want. Ended up being in this, well, I checked my role changed, but my graduate role was within finance and ended up being in this role for three, well, in that industry for three years and just didn't really feel very fulfilled. It wasn't what I was interested in. I, I've been passionate about like this kind of work and psychology for, I say like all of my adult life. And yeah. And then I heard about hypnotherapy on a podcast. I actually think it was, I actually think it started with my hairdresser who told me she'd hypnobirth in. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And then I think the day after I randomly listened to a podcast about hypnotherapy, I was like, oh, this, this is just, I'm just curious, I'm really curious by this. Um, and then I just did some research. I found the college, had a call with you, Mark. Um, you were doing lovely complimentary calls back then. So we had a call. Um, and then what really sold me as well was the fact that one of my lecturers at university um, worked works on your team as your Jana. Jana. Oh, right. So you're still, oh. Yeah, she taught me developmental psychology. When you did sure. your university, when you did your, I didn't know that. 
Did yeah. I heard that before? You just said, oh, that's so interesting. That's yeah, so interesting. yeah. And I was like, okay, this is legit. This is legit. I, I, I trust. And I, yeah, like obviously a leap of faith, but I just absolutely loved everything that the college like stands for and love that it was evidence-based. I don't think I would have done it if it wasn't evidence-based. And um, yeah, it just didn't disappoint when you, when you sign up, I remember got my, 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 all my manuals and I just thought it was fascinating and I'm still reading I still read through the manuals now and I find something that I haven't read <laughs> yeah I know it took me it took me <laughs> quite some years actually to go through because they, they are yeah there's some really really good articles in there yeah. so yeah there are three big course manuals everybody and uh and also then a whole massive pack of powerpoints as well mm. so that you don't have to screenshot you know you've got you've got the powerpoints and you can write your notes on them if i don't know if that's what you did with them was write your notes yeah. on them or not i know some people now are all very handy with their digital pads and things like that i do my digital i'm not gonna lie <laughs> oh that's good some of us prefer having things printed out that we can write on <laughs> and highlight with our, our highlighters so um yeah does anyone have any questions for harriet here because she's here a, mm. a few more minutes here and i thought it was just a great yes. chance to 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 ask questions of somebody who's actually i mean i did the same thing in some ways but a long time not a long time ago um but harriet's done it so much more recently um oh here we go Ooh. <laughs> how much money it's a bit important question it's an important question so i do it, it varies every month um that's so that's one thing it's not the same every month but it's probably around two and a half to three and a half a month depending on how many clients i do two and a half thousand to three and a half thousand yeah great yeah and that's yeah. you said that's broadly equivalent to um what you were earning previously yeah a little bit more a little bit more how good more. is that huh yeah and how many hours a week are you working let's see um again it depends on it depends on how many clients I'm doing at a single time. Um, I don't know because it it just it, it it changes every week because I also do like about ten fifteen minutes here. So and so I will send them all of that. Um, I'm also something I do at the moment, and then I do yeah my courses and like i do i've done a lot of workshops with daniel so yeah it's it's a lot but it, when you can be flexible with it it it's great and also i'm just so passionate about it i, I could do more <laughs> I, I think i think you have a, a a love of learning there right or i, I don't do. know whether we, we fired that up or fed it or whatever but i can see you you're just somebody who just really loves learning yeah 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 I used to always use that it's so creative yeah i used to always um i used uh, the, the like scripts and that the college gives are amazing and i used to always have them on like one side of my screen um and now i don't i don't need them as much i i have them there but i also do a lot of my own stuff which is which i love and i've only really just started doing that like my, my own techniques that's fantastic so you go you you be kind of building your confidence to be able to improvise and be a lot more creative yeah yeah definitely and especially when you combine it with mindfulness and you know you keep learning about all the other like approaches it's you can be really creative with it and you can really tailor it to your client um and that's exactly i want all my sessions to be completely individually tailored so they feel they they feel special because they are special each and every one of my clients is special and they deserve that individually tailored treatment so no session is the same i would say fantastic okay good, 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 good. anyway harriet thank you yes. so much i know you need to thank go you. um yes. and i'll stay for a few more questions a bit of presentation here but thank you for joining us amazing. and um lovely to see you amazing lovely to see you thank you everyone bye well 15 minutes she's just so, so let's dive good. in so uh, she is just a gem, Harriet there, so a beat. And she's really involved with helping people a lot um, with their social media because she's went out and really, she did a whole business coaching course with Mark Austin, which fired her up massively um, and got her very successful in a particular area. 
And then she learned, studied social media and took lots of courses. She's a little learner and get stuff done. And um, she has a TikTok channel with 15,000 people, followers on it, and she doesn't have a website. They just She just posts on there. It's the only marketing she does is, is writes and records all her videos two days a month. It's what it takes her to do that, and that's it. And she, she sees about 15 clients a week. Um, she, she hasn't done any more than that. She's very happy with that. Um, so yeah, and she runs it. She, she's going to be running, uh, social media sort of, um, uh, trainings and webinars and a course you can access, um, if you train with us. So we want you to be able to master that skill as well. So here are applications of hypnosis. She specialized particularly in binge eating. That's her area. She did an extra course on eating disorders because we, we don't cover that. Um, but uh, she did a short course on that and then combines all of our approach into that. So anxiety management, stress reduction, confidence, these are all the areas you can apply it to. Pain control, acute and chronic, pre-surgery, post-operative recovery, recovery, great area to work with. Irritable bowel syndrome, we mentioned that the results there are quite incredible. Um, menopausal symptoms, particularly good for hot flushes and um, hot flush insomnia. It's quite a lot of research supporting use hypnosis for that. And then CBT can be used for the rest of the issues in uh, with regards to that research on both of those things. Um, psychosomatic disorders, um, that was sort of mentioned. So that covers also skin disorders, migraines and tension headaches. Um, sexual dysfunction can be really helpful. Again, an area that's going to usually, it's going to require some specialist sort of training to work with, but um the people are more relaxed and everything starts to work as nature intended. Um, depression. Um, obviously, issues here across all, some of these here with regards to fear of competence, particularly around depression because of the risks of, 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 of major relapse and suicide and things like that. So there are many different types of depression, different severities and chronicities, etc. So um, mild depression might be something you can work with when you've taken our training. Severe depression is something virtually no private therapist would work with on their own. I mean, you need a psychiatric team supporting. Fears and phobias is very central to our training, learning how to work with that. Sports performance is very easy to adapt our model to that. Our model is kind of like a tool, a, a nice toolkit or like a Meccano set. You can kind of build your therapeutic approach based off all of the stuff that's there and work in sports or smoking cessation. I run a particular workshop on that, actually. Um, it's not an easy area to work in smoking cessation. Pediatrics, working with children, then also children's school study skills, return to school. School anxiety is a big issue as well. Um, dramatic arts performance, creativity. I, I love working with artists and performers. Uh, problem solving, weight control, much more complicated area than you'd think weight control, actually. Palliative care, end of life transition. What a wonderful area. We have a couple of people who specialized in that. Prenatal, postnatal. Um, everyone's heard of hypnobirthing. So there's lots of work there, but also afterwards as well, how you can, uh, how we can use uh, hypnosis and CBT to help afterwards. Habit control and habit change um, from changing uh, drinking habits, not addictions, drinking habits, exercise habits, uh, to stopping nail biting and twitches and things like that. We've got really powerful methods for working with that. Cancer management, uh, helping with nausea, chemo, pain and stress. There's lots of research on that, actually, um, from serious clinicians. Um, and exam stress and university stress, a, a big area to get into as well. So can you get a sense of how many areas you get into? And you, so you take the training and then specialize in towards the population, the issues that you particularly want to help with. Um, so become a pain control specialist, sports hypnosis coach, performance coach, healthy lifestyle coach, weight loss, hypnotherapy, educational stress coach, executive coach. The list goes on. Become a specialist we, because it won't take that much once you've got our model to actually focus in. So Louise Coyle, who trained with us, she was a previous work was in public relations. Um, she specializes in um, helping women go through menopause. So she put together a program based on the research here and then what else was going on. She's got a really, really good approach. Her website is called Changing Times Hypnotherapy. There's lots of issues. There's the hot flushes. There's other symptoms. There's stress. There's worry. There's social anxiety. There's concern about who I am now, et cetera, kind of more philosophical issues, if you will. Um, so, yeah, specialize. Um, how much can you earn? Uh, you've heard Harriet and um, Kate talk about that. Here we've got somebody, a couple of scenarios. Somebody's doing 15 hours a week, client hours a week, charging £75 an hour. They take six weeks holiday a year. 
their earnings for their business would be 51,000. Let's say their expenses are 11,000. They'd have the equivalent of a salary of 40,000 pounds a year. That's not their take home. This is what tax national insurance. Um, scenario B, somebody works a bit harder, 20 hours a week. They charge more, 85 pounds an hour, six weeks holiday a year. Their business will be bringing in 82,500. Now that's significant because 84,000 above or 85, I can't remember what the limit is. You're going to have to um, register for VAT. You don't want to do that. Very few private therapists are registered for VAT. Most people stay just below this limit. So this kind of usually is the maximum amount, unless you're doing executive coaching or you're working with businesses where you, you want to, you can charge VAT and the business doesn't care. But consumers yeah, who can't claim the VAT back do tend to care um, because there's 20% they can't claim back. Expenses here might be, let's say they're 22,000 in scenario B for room rent and marketing, extra expenses. They'd have the gross salary equivalent of 60,000 pounds a year. They probably, they'd be working. They probably wouldn't be still doing, a, you know, a lot of people on 60,000 a year are going to be doing more than a 40 hour week. This person might be doing 40 hours, might be 30, 35 hours. Depends. Um, and then I've got a part-time scenario there of somebody doing five hours a week, 75 pounds an hour. Um, just just to give, give you some ideas, some realistic numbers. I was pretty much scenario B, yeah? Uh, uh, Harriet, you heard, was uh, oh, she's not quite scenario A. She's doing getting about the, somewhere about 32,000 or something, 34,000. She's probably there now. Um, and Kate was more in scenario B pretty much. She was doing 20 hours at 75 pounds an hour. So, you know, this gives you a picture. Do people charge? Some people charge less. Some people are charging 65, 60, 50. I don't recommend you go much lower than that, but we have somebody we've trained, Flavia. She does a lot of work with children. She charges 54 pounds an hour. She does 30 sessions a week. She's very busy. 25 to 30 sessions a week, booked out. Because children and teenagers, so much, such a market there. So this is the college team here, myself and Fabiana directors. I'm the lead trainer here, the course teachers. Um, this is the teaching team here. Um, these are all great, just great people. They've all taken the training. They're all qualified in the approach and have the level five qualification. These are our coaches for the one-to-one -one tutoring. What a huge bunch of people actually. Um, quite a number of people now who've taken the training and are in practice and have the qualification. Um, and they're really good. And they really love doing it as well. There's Harriet. She's joined the team just on bottom left down there. Um, these are our senior associated teachers. Daniel Maria, I mentioned, one of the first people to be trained in CBT in the United Kingdom. Dr. Don Meikenbaum, who's 82 years old. Just recovering from a heart attack, actually. It's really, I hope he's going to be okay. He is, um, anyway, we have a great connection with him and we've recorded his lifetime legacy course. Um, he's one of the people that started CBT in the 80s that made the move from behavior therapy to cognitive behavioral therapy. An incredible figure, giant in the field. And he really, we love his approach. He likes our approach. And Professor David Attard is one of the most experienced uh, um, psychotherapists in Europe that specializes in Viktor Frankl's logotherapy. Man's search for meaning. He used to be president of the Viktor Frankl Institute in Europe, and he loves the hypno CBT approach. So um, these are our sort of senior board, if you will, uh, guiding us. A very, very experienced uh, group with um, over a hundred years uh, of experience between them. There, a um, few couple of slides before we finish. How long will it take to complete the diploma? Basically, both the webcast and the online diploma probably take the same total number of hours. Um, so it's just the formats are different. If we assume 350 total learning hours, if you wanted to do it in 10 weeks, 35 hours a week, 20 weeks, 75 hours a week. As you saw, Harriet did it. She did it when I interviewed her later. She got up one hour early most mornings and then did a few hours on the weekend. So she did about eight hours a week over about 10 months. Yeah. So key points here. The live webcast is quicker, more intense. It's boot stank, boot stank. Boot camp style group learning on our schedule. Yeah. Online formats, much more flexible. It's on your schedule. It's more individual learning or individual support from your coach tutor. Um, these are the 35 evidence based techniques, interventions that you learn on the training. Yeah. So you're going to come away with a whole range of techniques. And the whole question is then, how do you put these to which of these do you use with this client? Yeah. And that's the real 
skill and art of therapy, yeah, is selecting from this array of techniques for this client with their presentation. Um, enemies to your journey here, low self-belief, low self-efficacy. If Kate and Mark and Harriet can do it, why can't you? That's the question, yeah? And if you think, oh, I'm just not the right sort of person, something that can be changed there. Money beliefs and issues around marketing, those are, uh, need to be tackled. You cannot become a successful self-employed professional without tackling those issues. My recommendation is you take those issues and you work on them when you take the training as the issues that you want to work with. Does that make sense? We had somebody do that. She ironed out every single issue she got about marketing and money, not feeling good charging people, work that through, and she's so successful now. Um, all of those things lead to procrastination avoidance, kicking the can down the road, avoiding uncertainty, oh, dithering. Uh, enemy, your life is slipping by. Your life is slipping by. Um, the other two things here, pseudoscience, promotional hype, chasing after the magic, getting pulled in by these pseudoscientific claims, if it smells like woo, it is woo, yeah? And people who don't, who, I, I do like people who are sort of attracted to the scientific approach. And, and we're gonna offer a, it, it doesn't make it, you know, it's still, it's all about the therapeutic relationship and the quality of that, but let's build that on some strong science as well, yeah? So um, getting pulled into the pseudoscience, all the hype that's out there, chasing after the magic because this person's so famous, they treated royalty. It's got nothing to do if they're going to be a, not an effective trainer who can have you become an effective therapist, yeah? Um, I mentioned the special offer before. I'm not going to go through it here, but you are going to get an offer in your email. It's last until Monday. Um, what I really want to encourage you to do is to book in with a course advisor book in an appointment, talk to you. They may be able to adjust this offer to you or extend it slightly, yeah? Um, the replay is going to be available, available for seven days. will be in your email tomorrow if you've registered. Um, yeah, and if you click that button, get started on the website, it'll take you this page here, particularly C, talk to the course admissions team. That's the three 30-minute consultation. So we'll give you a link to that in your email as well to have a look at. So... Also in the email, I'm going to send you a free report on nine key questions to ask to become an informed consumer, how to avoid the hype and choose a valid, effective training program, and um, read our Trustpilot reviews there. That should say 125 reviews on Trustpilot. Um, and we've got some other webinars as well if you want to watch them. So that's a wrap there. Uh, I see somebody just put another question in. Do you want to do we don't do, I mentioned, Angela, we don't do face-to-face. -face. We do live webcasts like this, or we have the online pre-recorded, but you have um, tutoring. Again, live webcast tutoring, you're not, but one-to-one. -one. So you get a lot more one-to-one -one contact with somebody. Um, when you take our online diploma, you can actually get more time with a, 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 a trainer, or in this case, a sort of tutor supervisor, than you would in a group learning situation. And certainly in a live, you're going to, you, when you take a, a, a live training or a webcast training, you're never going to get 15 hours on your own talking with the trainer. Yeah. So the online diploma is a very, very special tailored route. And I spent a long time thinking about how to make it as good as the live training. Um, and that's the solution I came up with was the one-to-one -one tutoring aspect. 15 hours. It's a lot. It's a lot of support. Most people don't use it all as well. So, um, that's a wrap. I hope you found that helpful. Um, those of you still with me, I know a few people have drifted away, which is completely understandable because I've been going, oh my goodness, nearly three hours. I'm tired. You must be tired too if you stayed with me. Um, so was that helpful? Any other questions before I go? I'm very happy to, to stay here. <laughs> Susie, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. I do this every Tuesday as well. How do I remain so interested in presenting? Because I don't know, I love talking about it. I love sharing it. I love I love conveying the powerful knowledge to people, important knowledge, yeah? And I think this is important because even if one person tonight goes, wow, that dream could become a reality and they take action on it and that becomes, that, that's just, hey, that's great. You know, I'm not, I'm not here to sell training courses I'm, I'm here to help people have new 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 life directions and and their own their own successful therapy businesses yeah i was born to do this yes do it do it do it do it i love that
I love that because that's you got to feel that dream inside, you know, and go for it. Um, and and it's only by going for it that you'll find out. How will you ever know otherwise? That's a really interesting question. I don't know if I'll be able to do it. How could you find out? Oh, can I watch a therapy session? No, that's not going to help you. Got to go and do it. Yeah, I don't know. How will I know? In the swim, you got to get in the water. Do it. Then you you can change your mind later. But do it, yeah. And I, I can assure you, you may have heard both for Harriet and uh, I think Kate particularly spoke about how powerful, personally, transformational it was for us, for her. It was for me. Remember, I spent 15 years with a spiritual master, yeah, and still the training was so transformational for me. So, um, yeah, yeah, a lot of good stuff. NTD? Anyway, the NTD. I don't know what the NTD acronym means. Maybe I'm I'm just too tired to understand. But you're very welcome. Um, you're very welcome. Thank you all. Good night. Um, maybe that's that was. It. Well, you're going to talk to Danielle. She's fabulous. I love Danielle so much. She's so enthusiastic and upbeat. Stay positive. Um, be hopeful. There's there's all sorts of possibilities out there. Very good, Corinne. I, I, I love to hear that. And I know I've spent the extra time here, but hey, it's <laughs> this is an important decision. Not just your time and money, it's the opportunity cost if you don't make the right decision as well. Um, and you know, and I, I want people to really be informed before they take it. That's why you can do an observation day, remember, if you want, or you can do those first four days. If you're not sure, dip your toe in the water and find out because you can, it's easy to just to. to Butts around and go from thought to thought to thought. Dive in. Join us for the first four days in April. See what that's like. Or come for an observation day. We've got some days coming up actually soon in, in March where you can drop in and watch for half a day or something like that. Okay. We're very transparency is one of our core principles. So we want to be really open with it. Okay. I saw some other questions come in here. Brilliant. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, go get some rest. I'm going to get some rest. Do you recommend therapists in London? Olivia, write in um, and we'll we'll find somebody. Yeah. Send a message in um, and we'll find somebody or somebody to get in touch with you. Uh, but yes, um, there's the, the several. OK, Dep depends on the issue and what's, you know, but, but send that in, get in touch. We'll find somebody. Good night, everybody. Take care. Take care of the people around you. Take care of um, your environment. And um, yeah, take care of yourselves and have a great night's sleep. Unless you're just getting up at the other side of the world, maybe in South, I don't know what the time zone is in South Africa, but whatever. Have a lovely evening or a lovely day, whatever your time zone. Good night, sweet dreams.